AEW Dynamite, also October 30th, 2019. Tony Schiavone opens the show at the airport, where the Rhodes brothers arrive on their plane. They hug goodbye, Dustin and Cody do. Dustin goes one way, Cody goes the other. And Cody and Tony ride in a limousine together to the building to do the contract signing. So I didn't think about this till just now. But why didn't Dustin get in the limo with Cody and Tony Schiavone? Never explained. Because they did both end up at the building. They went. They left point A, and they both arrived at point, point B, and there was plenty of room in this limo for he, as big as Dustin Rhodes is. He would have fit. That was kind of weird. So that was not explained. They get in there, and Tony makes sure to say, Cody, I'm so glad to be with you here tonight. <laughs> we get a clip from after the show last week, actually, of... Hawk going after Moxley after the time limit draw. Omega made the save, of all people. And then Hangman Page, Hangman Page challenged Pack for full gear. And then Moxley goes backstage where he's called into Tony Khan's office. And we hear shouting, and there's subtitles. And Moxley gets the terrible news that his match against Omega at full gear is now going to be an unsanctioned match. So he's going to beat Kenny Omega, and it's not even going to count. And he's furious. What happens to Kenny Omega is on your hands, he says. Okay, so I talked about this last night, and I know a lot of people don't agree with me. And that's fine. You don't have to agree with me. But I didn't like this. And I need to reiterate why. Two weeks ago, we had a tag team match. And John Moxley was in there with Pac. Moxley, in the middle of the match, goes to get a chair, which would get him disqualified. He would lose. Pac takes the chair away from him. He says, you don't want to lose this match by DQ. Moxley boots him, DDTs him, and walks out on him. Okay? As a fan, when I watched that, my conclusion was... This guy is a crazy guy who doesn't care if he wins or loses. He just wants to get the job done. If he cared about wins and losses, why did he get a chair? Why did he boot his partner? And why did he walk out on his partner? Now, two weeks later, he's furious that if he beats Kenny Omega, it's not going to count on his record? Now... I'm sure that you can find different ways to explain why he's mad about one thing and not mad about the other. But as a fan, I don't understand this guy all of a sudden. Does he care or not? Later he comes out and he cuts a promo, and he reiterates that he's furious that his win isn't going to count. But then he goes, you can take your wins and losses and shove them up your ass. So does he care or does he not care? I want to know what this guy is all about. Yes, Ken. What is his character? I don't know. I thought it was a guy that didn't care about wins and losses. And he's now a- I've been told something different on this show. Well, he's a crazy guy. That's your excuse? Well, that's... He just flip-flops with each passing moment? Yeah. I ain't buying that one. Okay. What about you, Vinny? Well, Brian, I would tell you that John Moxley at no point cared about winning a tag team match with Pac. That was the farthest thing from his mind. But I think he really, really, really wants wins as a singles... And he really, really, really wants a win over Kenny Omega. Okay, that's all fine. But are you telling me that if you were John Moxley, okay, Mm -hmm. if you beat Kenny Omega, you beat him. You're the winner. But on a piece of paper, it's not listed as a win. Like, you don't have the satisfaction of beating Kenny Omega. He wants it on public record. He wants it undeniable. Right. I'm not count. sold on this storyline, all right? Mm-hmm. That's my opinion. I have done my best. Sammy Guevara versus Hangman Page. So I don't know if they planned it this way. I've mentioned before what an unbelievably great heel Sammy Guevara is. He has lost the panda head, which is actually a good thing because I don't want the inner circle to be a joke. But he's still the best ever. Yes. And he comes out and poses on the ramp, and his music's playing. He's got his, his uh, video going, and it says, The best ever. And then down at the bottom of the screen, (laughs) Owen 2. Awesome. That's awesome. He's the Spanish god as well. I I suppose so. So. I love this man. Is Hangman from West Virginia? 
West Virginia. I presume so. They were in West Virginia. He was over like a god. They had a very, very fun opening TV match. Paige uh, took a back first fall in the apron for the heat. And then, Aaron's Creek, Virginia. I see. Virginia. Just across the state line. Uh, so Paige comes back, and Guevara also falls in the apron. And they start going back and forth. And there was a point where they're, they're doing some moves. In my head, I thought, this match has gone on long enough. They should end this. And the instant I thought that, Paige goes to the apron, flips over, hits the buckshot clothesline, buckshot clothesline and pins him. Perfect timing. Hey. A very good TV opener. This was everything that I have been asking for for a month now. Hangman Page came out. They put him in the ring with just the best heel. So it was not that match where he comes out and there's crickets and everybody else is the big star. There's not dueling chance either. They loved this guy. Yes. He went in there. He sold a little bit. He made a comeback. He pinned the guy. He grabs the mic as the fans are going crazy. Yes. And in fact... On TNT, you can say the word shit. And so he said, it's no secret that things have not been going so well for me lately. But man, tonight felt good. And there's going to be some real cowboy shit at this pay-per-view. Place goes crazy. They start chanting cowboy shit. And I was like, right there. Now this guy comes off as a star. Yeah. I know something about him. I, I, as I, I, I try to watch this as a fan, okay? If I'm a fan watching the show the first three weeks, they tell me Hangman is a star, but he never says anything. They do not show me. He comes star. out there and like the crowd's dead, and I'm just like, I don't get it. Well, now as a fan, he came out and they loved him, and he won, and he cut a promo, and the people loved the promo, and it was edgy, and when it was over, I thought, now, there we go. Yes. Perfect. The other key to this is, he didn't talk for 20 minutes. No, he or got 10 in minutes, and out. Or three. He probably talked for one minute. I've been losing. I won tonight. Things felt good. At the pay per view, you're going to see some real cowboy shit, and I'm going to take Pac's head off. Great. And he was done. They were crazy. It was perfect. Excellent. Private Party had chains of the Rock and Roll Express backstage. That was great. We had Shanna, who is Portugal's perfect athlete. Even though she was introduced to hitting from France, I believe. Versus Hiku, uh, Hikaru Shida. Hikaru Shida. Hikaru Shida. Hikaru Shida. So, no one cared about this early. This is the first match in the history of AE, AEW Dynamite where at some point, nobody cared. And really, it was the first two-thirds of this and nobody cared. But they were polite. They were polite. They, they, they were, everyone was patient. Nobody panicked. They had a match. It was good. My favorite thing in this match, I can't believe I've never seen this before. Shanna's going to make her comeback. And she wants to get the crowd clapping along for her. But rather than just stand back and clap her hands, she grabs a face lock and claps Sheeta's back. And it worked. And the crowd started clapping along to the back slaps. The crowd did finally get into the near falls. And they, they did the kind of finish that I love. And I... I if it was real, you'd see this more often. Sheeta hit a big move. I, I forget what it was, but she got a near fall off a big move. And Shanna kicked out. So Sheeta said, okay, I'll do something else. Hit a Shining Wizard and won. Yes. Great. She this, had. This was not the deal where somebody hits a move and the other person just hits their move. Or no, 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 nobody kicks out and then makes a comeback. No. Shanna had this much gas in the tank left. She kicked out of move A. So Sheeta said, all right. And she did move B, a Shining Wizard and pinned her. Great. I, I love this. This is a professional wrestling match. They worked the crowd, so the crowd was into it by the end. This is a good pacing, a very watchable show. I was in love with this so far. So, I really like this match. And there was also a women's match on the AW Dark show, a four-way, which, to be fair, there were a couple of very contrived things. Like, they started with a four-way lockup. Mm. That's ridiculous. Mm. But, I mean, that was, like, the worst offense. And then there was another women's match on uh, NWA Power. And all of those matches, like, Hikaru Shida is awesome. But 
everybody in the AEW Dark match, everybody in the NWA Power match, and Shanna here, like, there's women in WWE way better than all of them, okay? But I really liked all of those matches because in every single one of them, even though they weren't great, I felt like they were trying to have professional wrestling matches. That's all I want. When we went to that NXT house show and we saw, tell her their names. Aaliyah. Aaliyah and Vanessa, and Vanessa Bourne. Bourne. Yeah. I'm like, dude, you guys have been here forever. And not for one, not for one second did I think they were wrestling. No. You know what I'm saying? Uh, not for one Believe me, second, I do. I'm well aware. They were doing a performance. It was like Halloween night and they dressed up as wrestlers and they did a performance but they were not wrestling i want to see wrestling even though these women aren't the best wrestlers they're out there trying to wrestle they're doing their best to wrestle that's all i want i like this match it felt like a wrestling match and quite frankly the better wrestler won great <laughs> perfect perfect that's all yeah and for. the fans pop big for the finish even though they didn't care early because they respected the two women were having a wrestling match and somebody won okay i did not understand this next segment oh jamie hater last week lost a match to Britt baker so at some point i guess on aew dark i don't know brandy rhodes attacked jamie hater no this was just off tv because the angle they showed at the beginning of the show from last week was after the show went off the air. So this was just something that happened last week, but we didn't see it. Okay. They're showing it to us now. So Brandy Rhodes, in the things I have seen, has been Cody Rhodes' wife, and obviously a very powerful executive with the company. Why does she hate Jamie Heater? Does she feel hated? Vinny, for once, you're asking the wrong guy. Then... Now Brandy Rhodes is fucking Papa Shango. Yes. She does a voodoo spell. Yes. And brings forth Awesome Kong into this world. That's what I got out of this. And then Awesome Kong cut the hair off dolls. She summoned her via witchcraft. Yes. I have no idea what this is, and I hope <laughs> I don't ever see it again. I, I'm, I'm going over this now. Part of me wants to hope this thing aired on accident. Like they shot it as a rib and it accidentally put it on TV. Thumbs down to this part. Chris Van Vliet brings out tonight's special guests, the Rock and Roll Express. Oh, this was great. Who are there to present the World Tag Team Championship belts to the winners of the match tonight. Just overflowing with charisma. It's West Virginia, their old stomping grounds. They're having their the crowd loves them. They love the crowd. They're having, having the time of their lives. Also, we didn't men mention this, but did a cross promotion in the show with Rick and Morty. So appropriately, it's Ricky Morton. Yeah, here on the show. So before anything can happen. Santana and Ortiz attack these legends. Just came out, coming out of nowhere and sideswipe and just lay them out. They got loaded socks. Old school shit here. And they're destroying these guys. And eventually they take Ricky Morton over and powerbomb him through a gimmick part of the stage. Now the only part of this I did not like was that the AEW has been very, very good about having people have friends. People have guys watching their back. Rock and Roll's got beat up here for a long time and then got powerbombed through the stage until finally the Young Bucks But the Bucks didn't run out. Eventually they did. Like, I can believe that the Bucks were back there putting their gear on. They had one boot on, one boot off. Like, at least somebody came out. Eventually somebody came out. Now, it could have been faster. That's all I'm saying. Some people didn't like that the Rock and Roll's got beaten up because they're legends, but, I mean, come on. This show is four weeks old, and we need to establish to a new audience who everybody is. And so far, LAX, or whatever their name is, they're supposed to be the top heel tag team in the top heel group. They're getting cheered. They must do something diabolical to get booed. And that's what they did here. Like Jericho, Jericho does not want his top heel group to be those goofy heels that everybody cheers. They're supposed to be bad guys. Thus, they've got to do some diabolical things here to get themselves booed. Great. I'm fine with that. What better way to get heat than to beat up the Rock and Roll Express? The greatest tag team of all time. Because you know what? They could have a match with LAX. They actually could. Yes, they have had one. And Even I think, better. I think they need to do it again. I have no problem with that. 
We cut to Cody Rhodes and Tony Schiavone in the car. And Tony tells a tale. Oh, did he ever. He flew to Tucson, Arizona to film some segment with the American Dream Dusty Rhodes and country music megastar Willie Nelson. And Willie came out to the pool first. And Tony said hi. And Tony went to get Dusty. So he went to the hotel room where, of course, he found Dusty Rhodes buck naked. And Cody nodded and said, that sounds like Dad. And Dusty made sure that Willie had already arrived. And then Dusty explained, I'm going to make him wait because the star always comes out last. Therefore, Tony decreed, they should make Chris Jericho wait for their arrival. Now, two things. First of all, they should have ended there. Their point had been made. That's why they're, that's why th- that's why Cody's not arriving to the show until halfway through. It goes on for a long time. It went way too long. Cody's anxious about performing in front of his mom. He wants to impress her. They're rambling about emotions and how they drive us. That the, the second half of this is bullshit. Second of all, I get the point of the story because they needed needed to explain their why they were arriving late to the building, what their plan was. But I'm thinking this story you've told this kind of makes Dusty Rhodes like an asshole. A selfish bastard. Why does he just go to the damn pool and shoot the video? Because he's dusty. And that's uh, maybe that's the answer. Maybe that's the story. Hey, listen. Lord knows I'm not dusty. So this hey. went way too long, but I really did like it. I, I felt it was both guys felt so real. Tony felt like Tony Schiavone. Yeah. And Cody felt like Cody. Not for one second did I think they'd memorized something early in the oh, afternoon. No, no, or no, no, no. Gone over this fifty times or any it was it just felt Real. Yeah. It went on too long, and Tony said, Cody, I just want to tell you again, I'm happy to be here with you tonight. And I believe him. <laughs> I completely believe Tony Schiavone when he says this. John Silver and Alex Reynolds and QT Marshall versus the best friends in Orange Cassidy. So if you're the kind of person who doesn't like the best friends and you don't like Orange Cassidy on their, I was going to say, on a typical night, this was Rick and Morty night. So they came out dressed as cartoon characters with wacky wigs and masks and eyebrows on and a lab coat. The crowd all has these Rick and Morty masks on. That was the scariest thing I've seen this entire Halloween season. That scared the hell out of me. So they started doing this match. It's the guys who are a comedy act anyway against a bunch of jobbers doing a cartoon show promotion. I liked Chuck Taylor in his lab coat and giant blue wig as Rick Sanchez. More than I like Chuck Taylor being Chuck Taylor. They tease the big hug spot. They get cut off. The fans are just outraged. Orange Cassidy runs wild. He's also in a lab coat. He's amazing. And eventually, they love Orange Cassidy, and the best friends eventually get their hug, and they pin John Silver with a strong zero, and that was that. This was great. They, I was totally fine. They with had it. a show to promote. They had a wacky cross promotion to do. They picked the wackiest guys in the roster to do it. They didn't throw this in the, the, the tournament semifinals. It's not like SCU was out here in a wig wrestling for the titles. No. They took the wacky comedy act. Put them against some jobbers so you knew who was going to win. They did their comedy, gave the fans what they want. Everyone was happy. This was a giant thumbs up. All I know is that in order for them to succeed, they need to make stars. And to me, yes, they were wearing costumes. Yes, there was comedy. But as a viewer watching it, the fans are just going nuts for these people. They're going crazy for the best friends. They're going crazy for the hug. They're going crazy for Orange Cassidy. It's three minutes long. They got in, they got out. I liked it. I thought it was totally fine. It is time for the contract signing. They're up on stage with a big long table. Chris Jericho looking more like a rock star than ever in his life. In his when he came out of that pumpkin shirt. Purple pumpkin jacket. I just died. And the hair. The hair's the, incredible. The, the, it's flowing everywhere, free as could be. And Cody's at the other end of the table in his suit. I mean, very prim and proper. Jericho's got his sunglasses on and his feet on the desk. Yes. This was... It's funny, because it, this is the opposite of, like, awesome and man, but this was the establishment we want to cheer for and the rebel trying to screw everything up. Jericho says, This is the biggest match in AEW history, the biggest match in wrestling this year, and the biggest match in your entire career, Cody. If you win, 
you'll become what you've always wanted to be, the world champion. But if you lose, it might prove to you and all these entitled millennial jackasses here tonight that maybe you're not as good as you think you are. I'm going to sign this contract, and I'm going to teach you a lesson of what it's like to be a loser. I howled. He's the best. <laughs> it's just, He's the it's best. such, it's, you know, I've mentioned this a thousand times. When everyone, everyone who wants to get into wrestling always wants to be a bad guy. Okay? This is why. <laughs> you can wear a pumpkin outfit. Yeah. You can do a line. I'm going to teach you a lesson of what it's like to be a loser. You can pull all of this off as a heel. But, as Buddy told me, everybody wants to be a heel, but nobody knows how to do it. Mm. Jericho knows how to do it. You've got to be a great baby face before you can be a great heel. And he's he's the greatest. He's the greatest character in wrestling. Oh, anywhere. By far, by far. There's nobody close. So... Somewhere in here, the crowd was chanting that Jericho sucked because he's a heel. He informs them, I don't suck. Skiavone sucks. Because That was the point of my whole thing earlier. Mm-hmm. Every time Tony sat there and he said, Cody, I'm just glad to be here with you tonight. Like the second time they did it, I thought I had it figured out. I was like, Jericho's going to kill Shivani. He is going to kill Shivani. He's going to give him, he's going to put him in the lion, something. He's going to do something to the guy tonight. Tony escaped unscathed. Yes. I was worked. So, that, well, there's a key to all this because Jericho, a couple of times, he like lurched at Cody and Cody jumped up and Jericho mocked him for flinching, but really Jericho was testing Cody to see what he could get away with. And the answer was nothing. And he could take a little insult to Shivani, and yes, for those of you asking, he has been calling Tony Shivani Tony Skiavone for almost 20 years now. Actually, more than that. So, he insults Cody, he teases fighting, but he's not going to because Cody's on guard. And then in the end, he explains, because Le Champion has grace and poise and class, he goes to shake Cody's hand and then says, I'll see you at full gear. And he starts to walk away and Cody pulls him back. And before Cody can do anything, Jericho gets a little smirk and says, we can stand here all night, but you might be needed elsewhere. Because Jericho had two plans. First plan was to see if he could catch Cody with his guard down and beat him up here. That didn't work. So plan B is Dustin. And up on the big screen, there's that hateable, slappable smirk of Sammy Guevara, who lets us know that Cody needs to see this. And they cut to Jake Hager beating up Dustin Rose in the parking lot. And the first thing he does is he takes Dustin over to the car, pins him against the car, and just knees him right in the balls. Now, I believe that in his Bellator fight this weekend, when Jake Hager was disqualified for kneeing his opponent in the balls, yes. I believe he was trying to win, and the knees to the balls were, un- were unintentional. Yes. But But it happened. (laughs) But it happened. And therefore, it's totally unbelievable that this testicle-destroying madman would come out here just a few days later and attack this man's groin. And then, of course, because it's the Rhodes brothers, you got to get heat, they slam the car door on Dustin's hand. Perfect. Just perfect. And then because Dustin has friends, Cody's runs out there, MGF's out there, I think Heyman Page is out there. And Dustin, or uh, uh, Hager, and Sammy, and Jericho retreat, but not until Jericho lights a celebratory cigar. His plan worked. He is fucked with those damn roads. I loved it. This was a perfect angle. Yes, it was so awesome. (laughs) Just great. And by the way, those of you who don't follow Dustin on Twitter, he got a cast. Has a mild fracture in his hand. (laughs) Beautiful. It's perfect. Perfect, perfect, perfect. TH2, which is the hybrid two, which is Jack Evans and Angelico, and Kip Sabian versus the elite of Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks. All right, so I just want to say something here because we talked about it last night. They played a video before Kenny's entrance, and there were references to New Japan. There were references to Kota Bushi, and got everybody talking. Mm -hmm. And as of 
right now, Thursday night, there is nothing going on between AEW and New Japan. Nothing. So, just want to make that clear. Yeah. Uh, they played a wacky video. It went over my head. I thought maybe it was Rick and Morty stuff. Apparently, it's video game stuff. But you know what? As you mentioned earlier, Brian, this show is very popular with young people. And I am an old person. So I just said, hey, there's a wacky video plan. It's short. I don't get it. There's Kota Ibushi. Cool. And it's done. All right. So, yes, he came out dressed as a video game character, I understand. Sans from Undertale. I see. I did recognize... Uh, with the Megalovania theme. Mm, ah, These perfect. people on Twitter were going crazy. Well, as, I, as I mentioned, I am an old person. So I did recognize Ken and Ryu from Street Fighter when the Young Bucks came out. Yes. <laughs> so they're doing this tag match. Do you know what match I have always needed to see and never knew I needed to see it until I saw a little bit of it? Kenny Omega and Jack Evans. Holy shit, Kenny Omega and Jack Evans. Yes. It's perfect. First of all, they're both great anyway, but they are a perfect fit with each other. And if you watch these guys do this, you would think they were in the middle of a best of 500 series. If they were smooth as glass, everything they did was perfect. Everyone else is very good too, but they were the unquestioned stars of this match, both of them. There's a million big, hot, flashy moves. There's a million tags. This is not a great tag team match. This is a great display of athletic moves. And finally, I, just, I wrote way too much about this. I'm going over trying to find this. There's the finish. Oh, that's right. Evans, because Jack Evans is a great heel to play off the great baby face that Kenny Omega is. There's like a train wreck spot. Everyone does a big move. Omega's left in the ring, and... Jack is going to do some kind of springboard on him. But as he is in midair, the Bucks zoom in out of nowhere. Jack zooms into a triple, triple super kick. Easy for me to say. And Omega finishes him off with a V trigger and the one winged angel. Now, there actually was some psychology to this. There was like comebacks and heating back and forth. But it was way more like you would see in a Lucha Libre trios match than a traditional U.S. tag team wrestling match. But it was great. I had a ball watching this match, and I want Kenny Omega versus Jack Evans. You got Dynamite every week. Surely you can put that together. AEW Dark. Is it on there? No. Oh. But I have another show. Well, if they do, I'll watch it. Yes. So great. And then uh, as as the Young Bucks are high-fiving fans at ringside, Proud and Powerful is the new name for LAX. Uh. The Proud and Powerful. They are wearing masks. They pull them off. They jump the Young Bucks, beat them up a little bit, and then Omega's right there to chase them away. I, that's another thing I love, by the way. And they have never deviated from this rule. The heels always run from a fair fight. Great. They will sucker punch these dudes. But as soon as their buddy shows up, they run for the hills. You mean they don't beat them up with a two-on-four advantage? Not overcome wow. the odds. Huh. They, they, more than the point, they don't even try. How are these baby faces over? I don't they they don't it. even try. They're cowards. Yes. <laughs> they run from the fight. <laughs> we have... The librarian Peter Avalon and his sidekick, the librarian Leva Bates, <laughs> which is just, it's fun. They're not, let me make this clear. They're not the librarians. He's the librarian, and she is also the librarian. They're both librarians. No, Brian. Oh, I just, see. If you read okay. the sorry. graphics, if you read the graphics. I'm sorry, I got it. Yes. That makes it funny. When hey, it, listen. It wouldn't be otherwise. This is a perfect usage of Peter Avalon and Leva Bates. Amen. Listen, I think that Peter Avalon is a good worker. When he does matches on AW Dark on YouTube, fine, great, dark matches, whatever. But his character, he comes out here, he's that annoying guy. Yes. People are booing he's him. The annoying comedy they do not heel. want to see the librarian. And so John Moxley comes out, and now he's Steve Austin because he beats up Peter Avalon. Obviously, yes. Everybody goes absolutely crazy. And then he cuts his promo about, I'll say, whatever he's. It was a tremendous promo. It was the best. But I, I need him to make up his goddamn mind. So, yes, the, the, the obvious parallels between John Moxley and Stone Cold Steve Austin are unavoidable. But that's fine. That's fine. because Mostly because Austin's not around anymore. It's not like you're ripping off the other show. So, he gets a monster reaction. Like, you can't say that WWE did nothing with Dean Ambrose, because he was WWF champion for a long time. And as I recall, I hated his title reign. But man, he's a star among stars on this show. And he's upset. His match is unsanctioned. No time limits, no Kenneths, no DQs. But it doesn't even count. He's going to beat Kenny Omega, Brian, and they'll pretend like it never happened. They want to treat him like a freak, like an outsider. 
and put him in a box so he won't cause trouble. He's the baddest and sickest son of a bitch in this game. Nobody will prove him wrong. If you think I'm out of control now, you ain't seen nothing yet. I'm going to beat Kenny Omega within an inch of his life. You're going to see wrestling violence like we haven't seen in decades. Omega's blood is on AEW's hands. Kiss my ass. Stay the hell out of my way. Do you know that WWE had this guy and they made him a goofy comedy character? Yes. For years. Years and years and years. This was ungodly great. This was a thing of beauty. I've said many times that I don't understand why people watch WWE main roster shows so they don't have to. But in all seriousness, how can you have watched a lot of shows these days, but this promo in particular, how can you watch this promo and ever watch a WWE promo again? I don't understand. Well, lots of people do, Vinny. Weird. Less now than <laughs> in decades, but they're there. SCU versus Lucha Brothers in the Tag Team Tournament Finals. Private parties in the front row. Of course they are. The Dark Order is watching backstage. They had an awesome tag team wrestling match. And I do emphasize a tag team wrestling match. The Lucha Brothers are learning how to use these tag ropes. Yeah, but they're still... They're still learning, I said. They're at 50%. It's better than last week. Okay, they need to be at 100%. You understand? Well, they'll get there, Brian. There's four weeks in the show. I realize that, but come on. Give me a break. There was a train wreck spot that was a true train wreck. Frankie Kazarian fell on his head on the apron luckily he died. He tried to do a Hurricane Rana off the post to the floor. There's a ring apron in the way. <laughs> he's he, Apparently he's fine, but it was brutal. Yeah. That's two members of SCU that have bonked their heads on something hard over the last three weeks. Yes. Scorpio Sky better watch out. He's the last one left. So everyone looked great here, especially Ray Phoenix who is breathtaking with like everything he does. He's, he's, he's spectacular. He's magnificent. He's marvelous. He's just incredible. But in the end, the Lucha Brothers, they're in control. They hit a bunch of big moves, and they go for their package pile driver foot stomp combo. But Scorpio Sky turns the package pile driver into a small package, and Frankie Gazarian zooms in out of nowhere to wipe out Pentagon and take him out of things, or wipe out uh, Phoenix and take him out of things. And Scorpio Sky, who originally had backed out of this tournament to allow his more experienced friends their time in the spotlight, who came in as a replacement when his partner was taken out seconds before the match in the opening round, when he had to wrestle in like one shoe and jeans because he was not prepared. In the end, he's the guy who gets the pin to win the tournament and win the belts. Not only that, Vinny, not only that. His partner was taken out by a package pile driver on the ramp. By this dude. And Scorpio Sky countered his package pile driver yes. and pinned him. Yes, this is perfect storytelling. This is beautiful. My heart was filled with so much joy by the end of the show. Ah, best part of my whole week. Well, at the end of the day, I mean, it's patently obvious that AW is the winner this week. I, we mentioned last week there had been no 10-8 rounds. Yeah, this may have been a ten-eight round. Well, you know, I, like I said at the beginning of the show, I was watching both shows, and there was a point where I thought, you know what, NXT actually might win this week, but it didn't. If you wanted to argue that Tyler Bate had the best wrestling match sure. of the week, I would, I would not argue with that. You could probably say that. But I, I, as a television show, as a wrestling show, AEW just blew him out of the water. Yes, yeah, very, very good show, and they got, I believe, one more show. I think next week is the go home show, yes. and then it's the pay per view. So, sure right. yeah. you know, what I like about this too is, you know, who hasn't done a big time promo for the pay per view yet? Omega, Kenny Omega. Yeah. Now, I would bet dollars to donuts. I don't know this, but I would bet dollars to donuts, whatever that means, that Kenny Omega cuts a promo on the go home show. Because this is not WWE, where they've got to shoot a big angle with both guys every single week for four weeks before the pay-per-view. Like, every week they've been focusing on different matches, and they've shot different angles. And obviously the most important one is Jericho and Cody, so they're getting, every week, they're getting stuff. 
They, go ahead, I'll finish. But not everybody is like that. Like, we haven't seen Kenny's promo yet, but we have one more week, so I presume that's when it's going to take place. Cody and Jericho are the clearly the biggest thing on the show. Yes. So they are pushing every show, but they're not pushing every segment. It's not overkill. They do their thing, and they are the focus for their one segment, and then we move on. The other thing I love about AEW, everything you're watching feels important. Even if it's just a women's wrestling match with one gal who you've seen one time and one you've never seen before. They gave it time. They made it entertaining. It served a purpose. Yes, there was a point. I, as a viewer, never feel like the company is wasting my time. No, and even early in that women's match when there wasn't a lot of heat... There was a near fall that was a close near fall, and the fans, like, they were furious that the referee said it was a two when they thought it was a three. Mm-hmm. Like, they cared about who won and lost in a match where they didn't even know who anybody was. Yes. yes. So, yeah, AEW wins. AEW but again, wins. still two good shows. They were two very good shows. I just I, loved AEW. I was very, very happy when the night was over. It's the best night of the week. And now I got to go watch Crown Jewel. Good luck. We're out of time, everybody. But hey, back to We also watched AEW Dynamite, November 6th, 2019. I'm sure he's a nice guy. I'm nothing against him. I'm just sick of these interviewers asking stupid questions on every WWE show that I have to watch. I'm going to go after every single one of them. It's their characters. You understand, Vinny? Do you understand? That's what we're here to critique. I realize that we've got this roster today that cannot stand up for themselves, okay? But if you are an interview person on WWE television, can't you just say, can I maybe ask this question? I mean, can you not stand up for yourself in any way when they give you the stupid dialogue to ask people? Really? I'm very upset about this. Every show I have to watch, and it's every interview person is so Dumb! That's the dumbest questions to the talent. It makes me as a viewer feel stupid. Then I watch Dasha on AEW Dark and she's like, it's unfathomable that that's Dasha. It is the biggest expose of the main roster of WWE and now NXT as well. Stand up for yourself and say, you know what? This question's kind of dumb. Don't even say that. There's like, there's got to be a way that you can say, can I ask a different question that's not so stupid? Anyway, I apologize. Sometimes I, I, get, a, I get away from myself. Is that the term? Get a wild hair. I get a wild hair. All right, let's do this. AEW Dynamite, also November 6, 2019. We open with Pac versus Trent. Now, Pac, of course, is very good. That is not news. But he's doing this match, and I had like a, like a bolt of lightning epiphany. He's good? It's not just that he's good. He is Tony Nese if Tony Nese knew what he was doing. <laughs> wow. They are... Even I didn't say something that... <laughs> they are very similar in size. They have very similar physiques. Tony Nese is a hell of an athlete. I don't know if he's... He may not be as good as Pac, but he can do a lot of cool stuff. There's no doubt about that. But his match, I'm watching and thinking... There's two random men doing stuff. I'm watching Pax match, and I'm thinking, this guy, this guy is a bastard. He's so he confronts Orange Cassidy, who of course is beloved. They didn't even do anything first. He just got in his face and everyone booed. Then he when he when he gets in when he's doing the match, he's a complete bully and an asshole. He's tearing Trent apart. It's all brawling, it's all manhandling, it's all stomping. He's not doing anything cool. He's just taking this guy apart violently. And then right before the comeback, he does one big dive. I take it back. It was, it was shortly before the comeback. But the point is, he does one big dive out of the ring. The place goes nuts. Throws him in, does one big drop kick off the top. And the place is going nuts. And he looks at them, and he snarls, and he puts on a headlock. <laughs> because he's the bad guy. You're supposed to boo him. That doesn't mean he bores you, but it means he can do cool stuff, but doesn't overwhelm you with it and doesn't do it at random. He does it so you get excited, and he puts on a headlock to ground his opponent and make you mad at him for not doing anything cool. I think this week was the first time I've noticed the corner cam. They have That's a, been there. They have a camera mounted in the corner. I hadn't noticed it before. It's really cool, and they use it at the right times. So... <laughs> 
The finish, and this actually should have been foreshadowing. I can explain the finish. Well, before we get to the finish finish, there, there's something else. They're, they're going to do an in-ring confrontation between Orange Cassidy and Pac. So Orange Cassidy gets in the ring, and then Chucky takes the ref. So poor timing there. But Orange does his shtick of softly kicking one leg and softly kicking the other and rearing back for the super kick. And the place loves Orange Cassidy, and they're all going crazy, and he steps back to do his big super kick, and Pac just hauls off and does the best bicycle kick to the face. <laughs> just punts him in the face, and suddenly Orange is not Orange Cassidy anymore. He's whatever the unmasked Chikara ante is. He's on the floor. He's hiding his face. His sunglasses are gone. He doesn't care. It's the saddest day ever in Orange Cassidy land. It's the best. They go on a little bit more, and then it is finally time for the finish. Trent, that, that distraction, by the way, the, the Orange Cassidy spot that led to Trent making his comeback, because then the crowd really wanted to see Pat get his ass kicked. So Trent whips his ass until Pat catches him with a brain buster on the floor, which is gorgeous. And then he goes up top, and he hits the black arrow. And Brian, why don't you then explain what happened next? Well, it actually goes back earlier than that. Right. So he hits the brain buster on the floor... And here's what actually happened. He throws Trent in. He climbs to the top slower than I've ever seen someone climb to the top rope. That's why I knew something weird was going on. Because he climbed the ropes really, really slowly. And then when he got up there, he stood there forever. And then finally he does the black arrow. The ref counts two and stops his count. But Trent doesn't kick out. And then Pac puts him in his brutalizer for the submission. So I was like, what in the hell happened there. Apparently this is what happened. They had four more minutes of stuff that they were going to do. They were told, you got to go home. I get This must have been outside. It was right around this time they were told to go home. So I think what happened was, when they were told to go home, I, I guess there was just confusion as to, like, should we go home now? Or, like, what should we do? So Pac was supposed to do a 450... Trent would kick out, and then he would put him in the brutalizer. I guess that's what... I know he was supposed to do a 450. So instead, because they were told to go home, he did the Black Arrow. And Trent, because it was the Black Arrow and not the 450, must have thought, I'll stay down. That's his finish. Yeah. So he stayed down, but the ref stopped because nope. the ref was expecting him to kick out. Nobody smartened the ref up. That's where everything went wrong. Yeah. They got a time call at the last second and had to make decisions, and everybody made a decision, and unfortunately they were all not on the same page. This was such an absolutely perfect TV wrestling match until literally the very, very, very end. Yes. Oh, well. Stuff happens. So then packed as a promo... He heard Hangman Page's naughty swear word. It'll make no difference. Hangman Page, I'm going to make an example of you again. Pack is awesome. Yeah. Tony interviews Cody. So Cody begins a brief speech about how he wants Jericho and his crew around because they want the best in all elite wrestling. Then he tell, gives us all a history lesson of men like Eddie Graham and Cowboy Bill Watts and the American Dream, Dusty Rhodes. And they were all great wrestlers. They were great superstars. They were all great draws. And they were also management. And they had to deal with the critique and the criticisms of being giant headlining stars who were also management, just like himself. Talks about how proud he is of AEW. Says, it is Ellis Island for a pro wrestler. It is freedom. The crowd's telling him he deserves it. So finally he says to... to get around this conflict of interest of being management and a top star. If he does not defeat Chris Jericho and win the AEW World Championship at full gear, he will never challenge for the AEW Championship again. Jericho, he says, you called me an entitled millennial. I missed reading that in your book, which is available right now on Amazon for $3. Huge pop. <laughs> it was awesome. Mainly because I'm sure we all think it's true. He says, you, you accused me of growing up with a silver spoon because I was the son of a famous wrestler. Well, you, you were the son of a famous hockey player. We had the same background. Quote, you stupid dick. 
<laughs> the best line. It says, you're a carny succubus. You need this generation more than it needs you. This is not about my dad. It's not about the dead. It's about the living, me, my wife, my mom, my brother, the 14 years it took to get here. At full gear, he says, I'm going to beat you, and you tell the inner circle that the elite is coming. It's going to be a match beyond, and we are going to eat you alive. And the place just goes crazy and eats all of this up with a spoon. That silver spoon, in fact. This was a great, great, great promo. So, I should add, by the way, that it's not $3 on Amazon. You've done the research? $7.99. Uh, Cody, you lied to me. Yes. It might have been $3 yesterday, and they were like, huh, up that price. That's possible. <laughs> All over TBS right now. You may have turned the market. So, so I don't know what's going to happen, but once he added the stipulation, I just presume he's winning. I could be wrong, but this guy, he's like a cult leader, but a benevolent one. Yeah. He whipped these fans into a frenzy. They are going to live and die with him on Saturday night. And I just can't imagine him losing and then ultimately going back on his word. I don't know what they're going to do. Because frankly, it seems too early to do... It is absolutely too early to be Chris It's too Jericho. early to do anything. It's too early to be <laughs> Jericho. This should be a long chase. It's too early to have MGF turn on him. It's too early for... for I thought that anyway. was happening, by the way, when I watched this show. Yeah. We'll see. It, it feels too early to do any of this. Now, I assume this is not a panic move. I assume they have a plan for where this is going to go, and a storyline that will probably pay off... A storyline that will probably pay off in 2021 or something. But it's intriguing, that's for sure. I mean, they could always... I don't like this idea that I'm about to give here, but they could always have him win, and then... They announce a Jericho Cody rematch on TV Wednesday. MJF turns on him. Jericho wins the title. So like Jer- like Cody was the champion. That'd be a very nitro thing to but do. But it was immediately taken away from him. Yeah. He never got a chance to be the champion. And then he feuds with MJF forever. And you do a slow build to him getting that second chance. I don't like that idea, but I'm trying to think of ideas because Jericho should be the champion. But I think that that Cody has to win this match. Because of the stipulation. Dark Order versus Private Party. So, Did you notice, by the way, mm-hmm. that Evil Uno is now covered head to toe? Evil Uno's... This is not a coincidence. Well... This e- is a decree. E- Evil Uno's... Uh, well, we'll just say it. He has the worst physique on the roster. I think that's fair. And he was shirtless before. He's not shirtless now. I kind of liked him, honestly, as this big, masked fatty. Well, just, that's fine if he's just a big, masked fatty, but he's he's a he's a main event tag they, team wrestler. They have plans for him, so, they, you know. So, I skipped the entrances, so I didn't... When this match started, I didn't really understand the stakes, which were twofold. First of all, they're doing a three-way, because apparently all title matches in 2019 must be three-ways now. Three-way at the pay-per-view between... SCU, the first place finishers in the tag team tournament and the reigning tag team champions. The Lucha Brothers, the second place finishers in the tag team tournament. And so this match here is the two semifinal losers against each other for third place. Yes. And they have medals, bronze medals that say third. Loved it. Joy. Yeah. Just pure joy I had of this. We need more third place medals in, in sporting. Dude, events. when I first saw the medals, I thought that the winning team was in the three way. So eh, that's yes. why they had the three. And then they explained no, yes. this is the bronze medal match. And there are medals. Loved it. So they had a thousand tags in this match, a thousand hot tags in this match, in fact, by both teams. Oh my God. Allow me. They're still over. Private party. Mm-hmm. I don't know how. Okay. <laughs> I'm not making up what happened in this match. So they get heat on Cassidy for a while. They're beating on him. And Mark Quinn gets the hot hand. And he leaps into the ring. Yes. Ahead of steam. And he runs right into a lariat. And he's dead. <laughs> yep. The most ineffective, like the most jobber hot tag you've ever seen. Even the announcers are like, man. This was something Barry Horowitz would do, or George South, 
So he gets killed. Yeah. And he sells. But then, like, a minute later, he just makes a comeback anyway. Which begs the question, like, why did you do that spot where you hit the ring and got killed? There was a, a lot of... Well, frankly, yeah, none, none of what happened in this match mattered. There, when uh, uh, Dark Order did their 450, 450 splash slash cannonball in the corner combo... Yes. That was the coolest thing in the whole match. It should have been the finish because they weren't going, going over. Now, there was another tag, and I can't remember who it was. It actually might have been one of the heels, which is at least a little bit better, but somebody got a hot tag, and they did a springboard. Their first move is get the hot tag, go for a springboard. And they got super kicked out of midair yeah. two times in this match. Yes. I'm pretty sure it was Cassidy, I think. I think it was both. I think both of, of Private Party got a hot tag where they were immediately killed. They need to learn that there's things that are entertaining and funny that you still shouldn't do. Sure. If you're the baby faces, your job is not to make people laugh at you. I laughed. I laughed uproariously at those two. So, also evil in this match, did he one, a one-winged angel onto the knee? Yeah. Which is way, way, way too similar to the finisher of the guy you're, you're pushing as the long-term biggest star in the company. Yes. I would have him not do that move ever again. Eventually, par- Private Party wins with the gin and juice, which is the top rope Rana into a cutter for the win. We didn't mention this, but on the NXT show, speaking of stealing moves, many times I have seen Keith Lee do the Leapfrog, drop down, drop kick. Yes. AJ's spot. Yes. Well, he's in the ring with AJ. Mm-hmm. And this time, which he's done before, it was a leapfrog, drop down, crossbody. Yes. yes. Gotta switch him up, Brian. He definitely switched him up that dice. Gotta catch him off guard. Yeah. So after the match, Private Party have won. They get their medals. And SCU is in the ring with their belts and their medals. And the Lucha Brothers are on the apron with their medals. Because these are prizes and trophies to be won and displayed with pride. That was my favorite part of the whole match. This match was fun, but boy, was it chaotic. It was chaotic. It was the most green that Private Party has ever looked. But the fans, they so badly want this to work that they just accepted everything. And they went nuts for the finish. And they love Private Party. And it's only been like three weeks. And right now, Private Party is like ten times as over as... The, uh, on Raw, what's their names? Street Profits. Street Profits, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, sometime back, there was a Cody Rhodes hype video on oh. Dynamite. First episode of the second episode, I don't quite remember, but a month or so has passed, and it is time to spoof it. And so Chris Jericho <laughs> does his hype video. This was his hype video, his personal Go home segment. Yes, for his title defense against Cody Rhodes at their well, their their first pay per view since Dynamite debuted. So you know this company has no writers. It's I, I assume this is all Jericho. It was Chris Jericho had a great idea. Oh, he did, he. And, and, and he, he had went a great idea. It. And as the, that great idea was like the, the 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 trunk of a tree, and each branch of that tree was also a further great idea. Yes, every detail of this was fantastic. So he is sitting alone, deep in thought, when his wife, essentially, Sammy Guevara, comes in asking which bubbly he wants. One has more flavor. One has fewer carbs. And Jericho just says, Go for the low-carb one. Either one's fine. And he kisses Sammy, like Cody kissed Brandon in that video. And then, whereas Cody went to go to a float to clear his mind, Jericho gets in the tub with his hat and his scarf, And the bubbly. They made a series of experts doing sit-down interviews. Cody had the announcers, his longtime family friends, Tony Schiavone, Jim Ross, his brother, of course. Jericho first has Sammy, Sammy Guevara. Yes. Then we hear the words, a scratchy voice, someone talking about what a great champion he is. Soul Train Jones. Yes who is better known, slightly, as Virgil in the World Wrestling Federation. And Do you then, realize that because of this video, I believe this is the most over Virgil has ever been? Oh, I'm sure. There's no doubt. Maybe the very one time he actually turned on Teddy DiBiase. Maybe. That was a big... But, 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 he, but had the, he had the best line in... I would argue he had the best line in the whole video. 
And Sammy had the great line about Jericho's 48 and the youngest AEW champion in history. Yeah. I actually think Virgil had a better line. Well, he compared Chris Jericho's talent to the breadsticks at Olive Garden. Unlimited. Unlimited. Uh, Chris Jericho's aunt's friend said she knew Chris growing up. She always knew he would be the AEW world champion. <laughs> yes. Everything, and we were, everything's delivered totally deadpan. Oh, yeah. That's the key to making all this work. No, they, they didn't slap you in the face. There was no announcers elbowing each other and saying, this company has only been around. He's the only champion. Of course, he's the youngest champion. They didn't explain to you the joke. No. Because they, they don't think you're dumb. Well, the other thing is, they turned up the crowd. Yes. And the crowd's reaction to this made it even better. So we got a laugh track. They turned down the announcers. <clears throat> Pardon me. They turned down the announcers. So, like, we didn't have this Michael Cole laughing at everything. Yes. It was so great. We didn't even get to when they cut to Jake Hager for his thoughts. And he just stands there and looks mean. Yes. <laughs> how, about, how about Patricia, Chris's aunt's friend from church, who says... I know Jericho will beat the shit out of Cody at full gear. <laughs> and then Cody Jericho, he's very tired. He's got a lot in his mind. And he says, you know, it's very difficult to wake up every day and realize how great I am. This went on for a while. And the, the, the point of it is Jericho is not sweating this match with Cody. No! For Cody, it's the most important moment of his entire yes. life. Yes. For Jericho, it's Saturday. That's another That's another argument. Here's, here's some more arguments. I don't think that... Like, Jericho's the greatest champion in wrestling right now. By far. He's just the greatest. He should not be losing this title. Okay? But, if he's going to lose the title, he is the ultimate cocky heel taking this match lightly. It's everything in Cody's life. I mean, Cody kind of would look like a geek if he managed to lose this match to a guy who's just nothing but comedy. Another key that they never mentioned, which may not even have anything to do with anything, but it is Jericho's birthday Saturday. Oh. Do you know what he could do with, you took my title on my birthday? There's plenty that can be done here. But yes, this... This was one of those things where it was almost like too good, like it's going to make the guy a baby face. Yes, yeah. But, okay, if he had done this before the Hangman match, I think this might have been a problem because it's the Hangman. And the people are like, they like the Hangman. Oh, yeah. But they weren't super into the Hangman. Sure. Cody is so over they're in, they're in as the baby face David Koresh. Yeah. That this guy can do this, and he's still the heel. Like, people can like it, and they can laugh at it and everything like that, but they're still supporting Cody. It's not like when this was over, they were like, oh, now I want Jericho to win. I hope he kicks Cody's ass. Oh. Nobody's thinking that. They knew he was a funny geek. Yes. So this was, if you haven't gotten the point by now, this was the funniest thing that was supposed to be funny on a wrestling show I've seen in I don't know how long. Probably decades. <laughs> this is a masterpiece. Cody and Jericho, if it does not win Feud of the Year, like, what went wrong? I don't know. It's like the Feud of the Decade. Don't know. The greatest baby face, the greatest heel. The, I'm sure they're going to have a great promo match. that Jericho cut a few weeks ago, the promo that Cody cut tonight, this video. How could anything else win the Feud of the Year? What else is there? I don't have an answer. We have a recap of the tragedy of Ricky Morton being thrown through the stage last week. They run down the pay-per-view card, which you have not been paying attention. The Bucks versus the Young Bucks versus uh, the Proud and Powerful. I wrote P and P, and I forgot what the P and P stands for. I think it's Proud and Powerful. The Lucha Brothers versus SCU versus Private Party. John Moxley versus Kenny Omega in a Lights Out match, mm. and Chris Jericho versus Cody for the AEW World World Title. And then they, unironically, without any wink, wink, or hint of anything weird. Thank Fozzie for the official song for the pay-per-view. <laughs> yes. Jamie Hayter and Emmy Sakura versus Shauna and Rio. This was so weird. So Emmy Sakura is either 
the very she's either a horrible baby face or an unbelievably brilliant heel and i'm honestly not sure which because the crowd loves rio they like shauna they hate hate her her name is hate her of course they hate her but Emmy's out there. She's doing the Freddie Mercury gimmick. She's got the fake mustache when she comes out. And she tries to do the stomp, stomp, clap thing to fire up the crowd for making her come back. And they all just start booing her. And I, She's I, supposed to be a heel. Yeah, which, yes. which, which puts her on the side then of being absolutely brilliant at it. Because she's not... She's so pathetically begging for your approval. And you reply... You or they reply with scorn... But she just keeps on begging. She's clueless. It's brilliant. So this is another match where they had a commercial in the middle of it. We missed the entire heat. They, they cut her off, whoever it was, and went straight to commercial. When they come back, we'd missed the hot tags. We missed like half the match anyway. Shauna about killed Sakura with something like Angel's Wings. Dropped her right on her head. They do random stuff for a while. And then they get the heat on Shauna. They cut her off. She goes and hot tags Rio. If Private Party didn't have the worst comeback on the show, and they did, this would have been it. Because Rio hits the ring, a house of fire, and begins to trade cradles with Sakura until she gets pinned. That's right. <laughs> Champion got pinned. Champion got pinned by her trainer who is challenging her, That on, also on the pay-per-view. So that, that part's fine. This match is bizarre. Yeah, it was all right. It was not bad. It was just weird. So speaking of weird, I guess this is not as weird as last week's Brandy Rose segment. Hey. Brandy Rhodes. Whatever. This was better than the voodoo gimmick. Yes. But I still have no idea what's going on. Well. And I believe that this died in the ratings. I have a slight hint of what's going on, because at least Brandy explained. She's bringing in Kong. Well, that. But she has no authority. She doesn't run the women's division. So though her husband is an executive, and though sometimes she has been in his corner, she has no official position in AEW management. She is a manager. And she manages Awesome Kong, who may be getting the name Night Terror, based on this promo. There may have just been a nickname. It's not clear. But she says, who are the bullies now? I don't know what's going on. I don't know. It was short. <laughs> so this is not as bad as still trying to get the Forgotten Sons over. But Brandon Cutler wrestled Sean Spears. Yes. Sean Spears is 38 years old. Sean Spears has been wrestling for 17 years. I think his window to become a star has passed. He comes out. <laughs> he's got a no more garbage wrestling t-shirt on. Then they show an angle from, I guess, AEW Dark or whatever, where Tully Blanchard and Sean Spears grabbed a pair of pliers and attempted to remove the tongue of Joey Janela. Yeah. And they say this, and they say, that's disgusting. And then they move on. <laughs> what kind of bizarre old school <laughs> mafia thing is this? <laughs> well, Did tear his tongue out with a pair of pliers? Did he say something smart that made them angry? What the hell? That was out of nowhere. Then, as I'm baffled by this, Sean Spears gets a squash match, and he wins. Yes. Well, listen. Clearly, they think more of Sean Spears than you do. Clearly. Because he's got Tully Blanchard out there. Now, Tully Blanchard, when they first started doing something with Sean Spears way back months ago, Tully's doing some talking. It's great. It's Tully Blanchard. Ever since, he's just there. He's just a grumpy old now, man. Now, granted, on AEW Dark, they did the Michael Nakazawa match with Sean Spears, and Nakazawa used all his baby oil, and Tully's out there taking pratfalls on the oil. That was awesome. But why is Tully here if he's not doing anything? He's, he's not a wrestler. It's his job to hold the pliers. It's his job to talk. Why aren't we getting Tully Blanchard? We're not even getting him on AEW Dark. Give me a Tully promo. Totally underutilized. So Sean Spears wins a squash, and then Joey Janela comes and chases him away. And I, 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 I was baffled by this. I like this is a feud with a build. Yeah, Joey Janela versus Sean Spears in almost 2020. Yeah, that's the match. That's the weirdest thing ever. I don't know if I'd go that far. It's really weird, dude. 
dude, I saw Cody's wife use voodoo to raise Awesome Kong from the dead or something. That was weirder than Sean Spears and Joey Janela. That's less realistic. I don't know if this is weird. <laughs> like, dude. there's people out there who are into voodoo. I don't know who's going to be into Sean Spears versus Joey Janela. You need John Moxley video with lots of old deathmatch blood and guts clips. I did love this. Omega Omega never did a promo for this match. No. He only has a couple of words in this video. I package. honestly I don't totally understand why this match is happening, except it's very important to John Moxley that it beats Kenny Omega. Well, the idea is Kenny Omega's company man. He's chosen one. I see. So he must be beaten. But anyway, Omega does a line where he basically says, Why are you acting like you're mad that this is a hardcore match? What are you going to do? Chain wrestle me? I was like, thank God somebody's on my side. Yes. So I did like the way this closed when Omega says, basically, he says he wants an opponent to bring the best out of him. And they get to Moxley who says, I don't want an opponent to bring the best out of me. I want an opponent to bring the worst out of me. Mm. So there will be blood and guts in this here hardcore match in this pay-per-view. I'll say. And the main event of this show... Hangman Page versus, excuse me, Hangman Page and Kenny Omega versus Sammy Guevara and Chris Jericho. So Sammy has stolen Tyler Breeze's selfie gimmick. Blatantly. Unapologetically. They do the introduction. Then they do a commercial. And then the match starts. It's not that hard. It's not that hard at all. <laughs> I love the beginning of this match that are the baby faces are just beating on Sammy. And I can't remember what move it was, but one of the baby faces lifts Sammy up for something. We'll just pretend like he's lifting him up for a rack or something. I don't know what it was, but Jericho's in the apron and he screams, Get out of it! <laughs> that was his coaching. It was. <laughs> He's, he's a veteran, Brian. Yes. Listen to what this man has to say. Yes. This is wisdom. So, Oh, he's lifting you? Well, get out! <laughs> They're beating him in the other portion. They're beating on, as the announcers called him several times, Sammy G. Okay. <laughs> Let's hope that doesn't happen again. That had to be a rib on yeah, us. I'm sure it was. He's, no, it was a rib on WWE, I'm sure. Or, or a rib on Billy. He's with his, these guys. That's true. So he's Billy's long-lost love child and probably Shorty's cousin. So they had a very basic, very good, old-school tag team wrestling match. Dude, Billy Gunn could probably be Sammy's grandfather. <laughs> You're probably right. <laughs> Probably right. So, this match is this is one of those matches where it's so simple and fun that it makes you think, "God, I want to go to I want to go wrestle again." That's a high compliment coming from me. So it's all very basic tag team stuff, and then finally Jake Hager interferes. He hits Omega as he's running the ropes to break up the dive, which of course pisses the crowd off because they wanted to see the dive. He catches Sammy when Sammy gets thrown out of the ring, so Omega dives onto both of them. Hangman dives on everyone, but as he's getting back in the ring, Pac runs down and just kicks Hangman right in the balls. And Hangman goes in the ring, and Jericho hits the Judas effect and pins him. Fun! This was all very, very fun. I did love that Omega kept going for the dive, it kept getting cut off, and then he hit it! Yes. This yes. stuff is not hard! No, it's very simple. So, a lot happened in the post-match. Hey, I just want to say before you recap the post-match... Mm -hmm. The go-home show for Crown Jewel. The go-home angle for Crown Jewel. A show worth $60 million or whatever for the company. Was divorce court. Right. <laughs> that was the go-home angle for Crown Jewel. Divorce three, court. Three people who were not on Crown Jewel. Yes. So now what was the go-home angle for this pay-per-view on Saturday? Well, Brian, the main eventers were involved in a tag team match. Three of these guys have key matches in the pay-per-view. I don't think they've announced anything for Sammy yet. In fact, by the end of this, he had disappeared, which indicates he will not have one. But so first they start beating down. It's, it's Hager, Jericho, and Sammy beating up Hangman and Omega. Now, I need to compare this to, for example, the women's brawl on NXT where I never had any idea what was going on. Here, they let it all play out. They gave it time to unfold. I always knew what was going on, and I always knew why. Cody runs down, makes the save, lays out Sammy with the crossroads. He wants Jericho now. Jericho tries to flee, but Cody's best friend, MJF, lays out Hager with a chair because Hager's big and scary. Hits Jericho, throws him into the ring. Cody lays him out. 
poses with the belt. And you think, well, the show's going off the air. But no, there is more. John Moxley comes in the ring with a barbed wire bat. Cody is no dummy. So he watches what John Moxley is doing with this, with this barbed wire bat. But before Cody can get involved, Omega returns to have square off with Moxley. Before they can do anything, Jericho attacks Cody and Cody and MJF and Hager. They all brawl to the back, or at least to the stage. Omega gets the barbed wire broom. The two bloodbath guys are having a stare down. But then Proud and Powerful attack them both. So everyone boos them because they want to see the fight. The Young Bucks attack Proud and Powerful. They run wild. They hit a big pair of dives. And Tony Schiavone, as happy as I've ever heard the man, just screams, Yes! He's ecstatic with this brawl. Omega and Moxley... They wipe out the Proud and Powerful, then they brawl with each other to the back. So they already got their revenge, you see. Proud and Powerful attacked them. So I knew why they were mad at Proud and Powerful, but that was not the real fight. The real fight's with each other. So they brawl to the back. Everyone's fighting on the stage. Nick climbs up the entrance tunnel. Nick Jackson does a big dive off that into everyone. He dives off into the pile. Everyone just you know scatters and falls like dominoes. Chris Jericho, in maybe legit the best moment of his entire career, in selling this turns his back and stumbles, but is sure to stumble right into the cameraman and tear the camera down to the ground. The inner circle retreats to the ring, tries to get some safety, but the fight breaks out again. There's bodies flying everywhere. It's violence. It's carnage. It's chaos. And Jim Ross is screaming, you must buy the pay-per-view on Saturday to see more of this. And the show goes off the air. What a go-home show. This was awesome. Yes. Just awesome. So there you go. Those are the two shows. Well, here's what I'm going to do here. And, you know, we keep track of which show yeah. we liked better or however it's... I got it written down here. We each pick one show or a tie. I realize that we've we've messed this up many times. We started with a tie, if I recall correctly. You did. I chickened out on the very first week. Yeah. So some people are going to be upset about this, but the fact of the matter is it doesn't matter. Just some stupid thing we do every Thursday. Of course, so yeah. Don't freak out about it. So, in my opinion, AW had the better show. All right. Okay. Mm-hmm. But I don't know if it was last week or the week prior. There was a week where I said that AW had the better show, and when the show was over, I sat down and I got to thinking about it. I realized, you know what? That should I should have said a tie. I thought that they both had excellent shows that week. And I felt after the show was over that I was unfair by not giving that whatever week that was a tie. All right. So as a result, to be fair, Mm -hmm. while unofficially, I feel that AEW had the superior show this week. As a man of fairness, I am going to vote a tie this week. Okay. To make up for a couple of weeks ago when I felt afterwards that I had been unfair. A make-up tie. Yes. A a make-good tie. Yes. All right. I will simply vote for AEW. I do not hate NXT. I suspect my review sounds like I hated NXT. It does every week because we get mad at all of the main roster style stuff on it. We, we, the, the stuff that is bad on NXT is so... Irritating. It's irritating because it should be easily fixed. I've got to get it off my chest. Yes. So I, I, I did think AEW had the better show. I shall vote for all Elite Wrestling. There you go, everybody. Before we begin this full gear review, I do want to say a quick note. Uh, my wife and her friends flew down to the Bay Area for the Seahawks game on Monday night. And then once she had this trip planned, she learned there was a New Japan show the same weekend. She went to New Japan? My wife, Bridget, went to New Japan. Wow. I want to thank everyone who said hi to her and took care of her, including Dave Meltzer. Really? Who got her a better seat. Wow. So thank you, Dave, for taking care of my wife. I appreciate that. He mentioned nothing about this last night on the show. That's what she told me. Maybe, she may have been drunk. It may not have been Dave. I'm pretty sure it was Dave. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he could get her a better I, seat. It sounds like Dave. So with that out of the way, thank you, everyone, for being so nice to my wife. All Elite Wrestling Full Gear, November 9th, 2019. The Young Bucks versus Proud and Powerful open the show. Well, first you missed the Britt Baker B. Priestley match. I did not watch the pre-show or the dark match, whatever you want to call it. Britt Baker worked with the flu. Oh. Oh, can you imagine? Can you imagine working with somebody that has the flu? That'd be bad, yeah. Ref's going to get sick. Is that important to do this match? 
Well, yeah, actually, it was important. So they had a match, and B worked over her head because she gave Britt a concussion a month or so ago. I see. Yeah, which... So she's I, concussed and has the flu. I am never... Well, she's not concussed now, but she, she had been given a concussion, which led to this feud. I see. Okay. I... Listen, all due respect to everybody, I hate the gimmick where you have a real injury, and so they work over the real injury. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you come back from neck surgery and people start working over your neck. You know what I mean? Well, the reason she got a concussion was because she accidentally got kicked in the head. So now you're going to do a match where B is fake kicking her in the head? Accidents happen. That's why this whole match is taking place. Because of an accident. So she's kicking in her head. She's kicking in her head. And Brid makes a big comeback. Hits her destroyer, puts her in the lockjaw, gets a submission. Match was okay. The fans were respectful. They responded to everything. After the match, Britt leaves and B is down in the ring. And Awesome Kong and Brandy come out. Awesome Kong pulls out a knife. She lays out B Priestley with a back fist. And then she chops off a chunk of B's hair and puts it in her waistband like a trophy. So apparently Kong is going to run roughshod through this division, chopping off everyone's hair with a knife. She's the new Brutus Beefcake. This is weird. I mean, I presume, if, if we recall, did Brandy not raise Kong from the dead via voodoo? That was the impression I got. Okay, so I think that she's getting all this hair to put voodoo spells on everyone in the women's division. That could be it, actually. I hope it's not. (laughs) But that's what it sounds like to me. She's going to, like, stab the doll, and then someone's going to grab their back in the middle of the match? I I hope not. That's the idea behind voodoo dolls, yes. This Papa Shango thing wasn't cool back in the day. He never did voodoo dolls. Well... I don't think. He did voodoo magic. He did do a lot of magic. Just made people vomit and light on fire. So then we had the Young Bucks versus Proud and Powerful. With the Rock and Roll Express in the front row, including Ricky Morton in the dopest red smoking jacket. It was awesome. So there's some generational conflict going on between, well, just those involved and those watching AEW. Because they tried to enforce... Tag team wrestling rules in this match, like when the uh, Proud and Powerful tried to make a hand to foot tag and the ref waved it off. Then they made a legal tag behind his back. He did not allow it. He's, he's enforcing the rules. And Jim Ross is talking about what a great job he's doing. And the crowd is booing passionately and cursing out the referee. <laughs> well, listen, I've talked about this a thousand times. Everybody's doing whatever they want because they just work in every different indie promotion around the world. Now you're in AEW and we need rules. And I can tell you for a fact that there is a movement to get everybody to obey the rules. Yeah. It ain't going to happen overnight. Now, the reason the fans are mad is because the fans so far have not had to deal with rules. The rules, they should have had rules from day one. And instead, it's like they're five weeks in and they're trying to now enforce the rules. And it's making the fans angry when this poor referee is just doing his job. So, eventually they get the heat on Nick, when Nick cuts the, uh, uh, Nick throws a kick and hits the ring post. Yes. And so they're taking his leg apart for a while, and Nick Jackson sells his leg. Can we put uh, Nick Jackson's ability to sell the leg alone in the Hall of Awesome? He sold his leg better than anyone sold anything in a long, long time. He's climbing the rope super slow. He's, when he throws a kick... He sells his leg, and the big spot in the match is they're doing their comeback. He goes for the Meltzer driver and does a springboard, but he collapses because his leg hurts. Yes. So then they hit him with a move, and hit him with a move, and hit him with a move, and hit the street sweeper and pinned him. Nick Jackson is an underrated wrestler. That is very true. I mean, he's... I think everyone knows that the Bucks are great, but I don't think Nick gets the credit for being as great as he is. People think... He's really great. Yeah. The, the, when, when people s- say why they think the Bucks are great, it's usually spectacular combos and double teams. And not enough just being great wrestlers. Yes. And they are. 
match itself had kind of weird pacing, and the finish came out of nowhere. It was anticlimactic. It went back and forth for a long time. Yes. Before they finally got the heat. Yeah. And they just wanted to do this match, and this they did this match, and the people liked it. It the, went 20 minutes. The only thing that I didn't like is I can't believe that the Young Bucks lost again. They are doing the losing streak gimmick. They're, they're doing the story where they're falling down the tag team ranks. And I guess if that's the story, then they had to lose here. But, you know, I wasn't upset when Private Party upset the Young Bucks in the tag tournament. Dave was very upset about that. His theory is, you know, theoretically, there's a lot of new fans watching. And you got to get over. You can't just presume that the Young Bucks and Cody and Kenny Omega and all these guys are going to be over. You got to get them over. Then if you want to have them lose later on, they can lose later on. And I was fine with Private Party getting a big upset because the crowd was super in and everything like that. But I watched this match and they lost. And all I could think was, if you are a new fan, you just you decided to try out AEW on TNT. You watched it for five weeks. And you really liked it, and you decided to buy this pay-per-view. Like, the Young Bucks come across as nothing special as a team. Not in the ring, but like, they They, lose all the time. They they lost in the tournament. They won a trios match with Kenny. They lost here. It's too much losing. Off the top of my head, I think that's it. They've won won once now in, what, seven shows? This pay-per-view in Dynamite? I think that's right. So Sammy Guevara comes out to celebrate with Proud and Powerful. He has the loaded sock, and they're going to take these young bucks to town. But the Rock and Roll Express make the save. In the process, Ricky Morton hit a Canadian Destroyer and then a big giant tope. It was awesome. It I was the blown biggest, away. got the biggest pop of anything all night. It actually did. Well, not all night, but at uh, least in, up to this, this point. In this segment. Yes. And Jim Ross used the word hyperbole. <laughs> it's not the word he meant. That's what he said. Uh, yeah, they uh, Rock and Roll Express is great. They have done a match with the former LAX. Mm-hmm. I hope they do it again. This would be a, this would be a great TV match to build up to, or you could do a multi person match with the Bucks in there, or whatever. I don't know if I mentioned this on Thursday when we reviewed TV, but Sammy Guevara is very special because I've been watching this show and he never wins. He, like, always loses. The best ever. Well, I mean, it's more than that. <laughs> he is such a cocky, irritating little prick that he never has to win. Right. <laughs> you just, like, you want, it's like Stone Cold in the stunner. You just want to see him do the stunner on every show. Sammy Guevara could win one out of every 100 matches, and he would still be over. Because he's the kind of guy that you just want to see him get beaten on every single show. It's not like in WWE where if he never won, he'd be like a jobber. And and he'd just be like a geek. This is a perfect role for him. The guy that just gets beaten up on every show to make you, the viewer, happy. He's a fabulous douchebag. That's what I'm trying to say. I agree. Yes. And everything. Pack versus Hangman Page. So they had some, they had a struggle early. Not that it was a bad match, but Pack sold for a while, and then Paige sold for about an hour, and man, it was quiet in this building. There was one point you could hear exactly one person chanting bastard shit over and over again. <laughs> which, when I think about it, maybe the most profane chant I've heard. <laughs> well, it's, it's playing off cowboy shit. Yes, of course. Yes. yes. <laughs> bastard. <laughs> so... Page is a big giant moonsault press from the top rope to the floor. And then out of nowhere, Pac grabs and hits a brain buster onto an unfolded chair on the outside. This was insane. I screamed. They go back and forth for, for a while. They start to kill each other over and over. And now the crowd's finally getting into it, which is the sign of a well worked match when they're not into it at the beginning, but they are into it at the end. And Pac goes to the black arrow, but Page dodges that. And Pac tries a low blow, but Pac. Uh, or, yeah, Pack tries a low blow. Page sees it coming and blocks it. Very reminiscent of the Pete Dunne, uh, Damian Priest feud in NXT. And but he catches the low blow, hits a big lariat, and uh, hits the dead eye for the win. And this definitely peaked at the right time. This was a good wrestling match as well. Listen, I wasn't at this show, and I go to a lot of wrestling shows, and I tell people about the crowd, 
and I hear people that weren't at the show telling me about the crowd, and I'm like, dude, I was there. I'm telling you about the crowd. So people who were there said the crowd was great all night. And watching on TV, I did not get the impression that the crowd was great all night. And it's very weird because, as you noted, the crowd was great at the end of this match. Yes. But they weren't great at the beginning of this match, which tells me it wasn't my TV. No. And if I can hear one guy screaming in the middle of a match, that tells me the rest of the crowd is quiet. So I don't know what to say. I realize I just tried to explain that I thought I knew what the crowd was like, even though I wasn't there, after chastising people who do it to me. But it is weird. The crowd just, they were up and down during the show. And they were down at the beginning of this match on my television. We had a clip of Awesome Kong, or as I wrote here, Awesome King. That's wrong. Uh, beating, as I wrote, somebody up and cutting her hair. Now it's the beginning of the match. That was a dark match that yeah. I talked about. Sean Spears versus Joey Janela. The highlight of this match was when Spears took him to the corner and tied his ponytail into the tag rope. And... Then Janela yanked himself free, left some hair behind. Okay. So I'm asking myself, we were just talking about the crowd noise. I mean, there had there it was quiet at the beginning of the of the hangman page match, but it's just flat for this match. I'm trying to figure out why. Like every episode of Dynamite has seemed more lively and more fun than this pay-per-view. And I'm trying to figure out why the crowd's so dead. And then Sean Spears and Tully Blanchard hit a spike pile driver on the floor. And Sean Spears hit a DVD and he won. Yes. Well, that killed me. Took the air out of my sails. Hey, people really didn't like this match. It was bad. I thought it was fine. I was, it, was, it was not. I, I had was, one massive problem with this match, and that is that Spears gives him a power slam on the floor. He gives him a back suplex on the apron. He's clearly trying to break this guy's back. He throws him into the ring, and he puts him in a chin lock. <laughs> I was so angry. Well, you know how many times I've noted that there's very few rest holds in AEW? Mm -hmm. There's two guys that do rest holds. One of them is Pac, and he did one, and he just kept going. And Pac is unbelievable, so I'm not going to complain about it. Right. It was it was over with quick. And the other is Sean Spears. Both, I might add, WWE guys. They've been through WWE. True. Sean Spears put on a chin lock after working over the dude's back. Yeah. I was done. And the rest of the match was fine. I mean, maybe a little less than fine. But it was saved by Tully Blanchard leaping off the ring steps to help deliver a spike pile driver to Joey Janela on the floor. Yeah. This guy's 65 years he, old. They don't let him talk. He's been... But he's out there doing spots. He's been do preaching for yeah. like 25 years. Yes. He's come out of the clergy to deliver spike pile drivers off the steps to the floor. I loved it. And then, yes, Sean Spears won. I think they're going way too hard with Sean Spears. Oh, you don't say. But whatever. I mean, it is what it is. So, I'm sure everyone listening to this has at some one point or another been made aware of Jim Cornette's rant about AEW. One of the things he didn't like about AEW was that they have a announcer who randomly is wearing a mask and calls himself Excalibur. And that really, really ruffled Jim Cornette's feathers, as he would say. Of all people, that ruffles Jim Cornette's feathers? That's what, that's, yeah, that, that's something. Now, I always thought it was a silly complaint. But then we go to a backstage interviewer named Golden Boy. Yes. Why? Why, he, why, he, why is he golden? That's what he's known he's as. He's neither golden nor a boy. He was golden boy before AEW, so he's just golden boy he's now. tan man. He's interviewing Kip Sabian. This is so weird. It, it was fine. It was, here is a new character, or at least a, a, a character getting more exposure. He gets to get a promo. He says, I was straight in the middle when I got to AEW. I found there was alliances all over the place. I needed an alliance, so I hooked up with TH2. He did have a great line when he said, he, he, they've gotten off to a slow start. But can you name me one rock band that's ever had a hit right out of the gate? And then before Golden Boy could answer, he yanked the microphone away insisting, because, of course, there are several. Uh, he introduces Penelope Ford, his hot blonde. They are the super bad squad, and they insulted Golden Boy, and they left. This is all fine, but this, this is the kind of thing that gets done on free TV. 
Well, well this is also one of those things review. where it's good that you're here, Vinny, because you're an average person watching this show, and they're trying to attract average people, new fans. So the whole story here is Penelope Ford was dating Joey Janela, who is the bad boy. Mm. She left him in real life Aha. for Kip Sabian, who is super bad. Well, this explains then. That's why she says, <sighs> yes. why be bad when you can be super bad? So if you know all of this, huh. this was like a great little promo here. But if you're you or all of the other people who don't know what's going on, you are left befuddled. So they probably could have done a better job explaining all of that. And a tag team tournament recap. And then the tag title match with SCU defending against the Lucha Brothers and Private Party. Private Party and Lucha Brothers both have some terrible ring music. I want to throw that out there. Everyone had their medals, which made me very happy for this match. And then they just do this match, and it is a bunch of random stuff. Everyone just takes turns doing moves. And if you are one of the people who, when we said Private Party were green, you said you didn't see it, and that's fine. I'm not upset with you, but watch this match. Like, every spot in Isaiah Cassidy's comeback was but missed. It was not very good. Everyone loved the big train wreck Are spot there people the actually arguing the Private Party are not green? Arguing may be the wrong word, but just say, giving a different opinion. Well, there I, I rarely say this, as you're well aware, of Vinny, but that is an incorrect opinion. They are... They are Absolutely, positively, without question, green. They may be getting greener based on, based on this I don't show. know if I'd go that far. So when, when Scorpio Sky tagged in to save the match, it got much better. Everyone loved the big train wreck spot, especially Phoenix jumping about six times to do one dive. And then Kaz kicks out of a shooting star press. They hit the SCU later. They pin whichever private party, party dude it was. If you like really cool moves, there were some really cool moves here. As a match, it was nothing. So I thought for sure that the Lucha Brothers were going to be on the verge of winning, Daniels would come out and screw Pentagon, since Pentagon dropped him on his head on the ramp and killed him, mm-hmm. and that would be the finish. So they didn't do that, but... <clears throat> I'm still recovering. But after the match, another Pentagon showed up. Yes. The first Pentagon, I never realized, was such an idiot... <laughs> He starts dancing with the other Pentagon. Well, the, the first, the, the new Pentagon gave the first Pentagon the Zero Miedo hand sign. Yes. So the first Pentagon assumed, ah, he's on my side. He must be a friend. He knows my he knows my secret handshake. Well, he gave him the STO, and then he gave Phoenix the angel's wings onto Pentagon. And it was weird because, like, I thought it was so obvious the moment the other Pentagon showed up who it was. It was. When he gave the STO, it got like a pop, but it didn't get a huge pop. And it wasn't until he hit the angel's wings and started taking his mask off that the people actually knew who it was. I was flabbergasted. It's like, how is it not patently obvious who this was? I liked what they did afterwards. I still think my idea was better because the actual finish that they did in the match was kind of flat. They did all of these crazy moves, all of this insanity, and finally, uh, Private Party tries their gin and juice, and it just got broken up, and Kazarian hits SCU later and yeah. pins him. Like, the fans were like, what? It was absolutely nothing special. So I, I would have had the the interference. The video package for Rio versus Emi Sakura was the sweetest thing ever. <laughs> just everyone being friendly. Here's Rio. I don't think she was nine, nine years old in this video, but she was very young. And they've been training forever. She did gymnastics and got into pro wrestling that way. And is adorable. Sounds like me. So they're doing this match. <laughs> Jim Ross actually questioned whether Rio was too kind-hearted <laughs> to win. Yes. It's oh, a fair a question. Champion. It's a fair question, but it's a strange way of putting it. It's a fair question, but she's the champion. So yes. Well, the answer is yes. Uh, Sakura is still doing the stomp, stomp, clap like We Will Rock You, and is also doing the Deo call and response like Freddie Mercury, and it's actually starting to get over now, which is funny. She finally starts to get evil. She's scratching the back and fake crying and stomping the hell out of Rio, and Rio comes back, hits a thousand stomps of her own, and then suddenly, next thing I know, they're just trading 1,000 cradles at 1,000 miles an hour, and one of the cradles Rio wins with. It was good. Well, I mean, it was a they, they were playing off the TV match where they exchanged a whole bunch of cradles, 
And on the TV match, Sakura pinned her to get the title shot, even though they already announced the title shot. And this one, they did the exact same deal. And as they were doing the cradles, they did the exact same cradle from TV, and the crowd was, ah! They thought it was going to happen again. Aha. Uh-huh. But it didn't. And this time, Riho hit the tilt-to-whirl sunset flip for the pin. I thought it was a very good match. I know Dave thought it was, like, one of the best women's matches of the year. I don't know if I'd go that far. I thought it was, I thought it was very good. They did some really good stuff. Riho got the crowd at the end. I give it two thumbs up. It was a very good pay-per-view match. And then we had a, well, Cody, Cody, Chris Jericho video package, which kind of stunned me because I thought it was early on the show for this. And then I realized how long these last two matches were going to go. So Cody versus Chris Jericho with Dean Malenko, Arn Anderson, and the great Muda as judges. Although it turns out that was just for uh, a tease. They were never actually involved. I loved this match. It was awesome. I thought this match was out of this world great. Cody's best two matches in his career have been since leaving WWE. Probably a lot more than that, actually. I bet he would tell you. But his match with Dustin at uh, Double or Nothing and his match here were just fantastic, fantastic stuff. So, first of all, just the way this was presented and the way they carry themselves and the the, the intensity, but also the... Uh, um, what's the word? Not... There was, there was a uh, deliberateness to this A match. gravity. A gravity, yes. They, both guys were terrified of making the first big mistake. So it was not a million miles an hour. They were working a little on the slow side, but it was, there was an intensity to it, a gravity to it. There was, but I, I mentioned this on the Observer Show yesterday. They announced judges. In the case of this, went 60 minutes. And... I thought that they announced the judges as a response to having two draws in major matches over the last three months and wanting people to know that if you spend your $50, you're not going to get a draw. If it goes a time limit, you're going to get a winner, but it'll be these judges. So I presumed from moment one, there's no way this is going to a 60-minute draw. Yeah. But yesterday... Everybody thought they were going 60 minutes. If you were on Twitter, if you were on our board, anywhere you were on social media yesterday, all people talked about when this match started was, I'll see you in an hour. I'll see you at 10.15. Hmm. All I heard was, it's going to go an hour. They've got the judges. Everyone was convinced it was going to go an hour. I think it hurt the first 10 minutes of the match with the crowd because the crowd was very quiet. And they were watching this like it was going to go 60 minutes. Now, luckily, about 12, 13 minutes in, you know, Cody started to do a big comeback. And all of a sudden, I think the fans realized he's making his comeback. This thing is not going 60 minutes. And once I think they thought it wasn't going 60 minutes, they got super into the match. But I do think the judges being out there caused a lot of people to think, may, not, may as well not blow ourselves up now. We're going to be sitting here for an hour. So, the first big spot in the match is Cody throws Jericho outside in front of the announcers and he hits a little tope. See a hundred of these in your life. It's not that big a deal. They do some stuff. Cody's working the arm because Jericho uses the arm for the Judas effect. It's the arm he throws the elbow with. And then Cody throws Jericho out on the other side with his big entrance ramp. And he goes... The, the spot is he's going to miss a tope here. And in theory, it would be much safer than missing a tope on the other side of the ring where there's no ramp. Well, that was the theory. What really happened was Cody came down on the metal ramp on his face and tore his face open. Huge cut. And I actually... Multiple stitches. I tried to... I I rewound a bit just to see... Because my thought was, like, did he gig right before the dive? Did he gig in midair? And then I realized, no, he didn't gig. Because it was like a circle shape. (laughs) Which is not what you do with a razor blade. He tore his face open on the mat. Now, the funniest thing was... There's blood everywhere, and it's not like they ignored it, and Jericho was working the cut over. But the plan was, I'll miss a dive on the ramp and sell my ribs. You can sell the ribs. It was placed in the finish. So they stuck to that plan, which is, you know, it worked out. The point was, this is a very bad dive. It broke his head and his ribs. So there was a chin lock in this match, but it meant something. Because it was a chin lock by a guy who was already in dire straits going in. So this is an attempt to finish off a weakened foe with this chin lock. It wasn't just, I don't know what else to do. I'll grab his head. 
Cody gets the knees up on a Cabrata, makes just a this super hot comeback, and then he gets slammed into the ribs again. Jerrica goes to select, go, goes to uh, harass Mama Cody. Oh, the best. She slaps him across the face. She screams, fuck you, and hits him in the head. His <laughs> so mother. How many times are we on the Retro Nitro shows when Judy Bagwell, something terrible would happen to her and Bagwell wouldn't care? Mama Cody slaps Jericho. Jericho flees. Cody, before following up, goes to make sure his mother is okay. Yes. Because Cody's a great baby face. Yes. Then he flies in the ring. He runs wild on Jericho. He puts him in the figure four. Jake Hager, from the outside, uh, breaks this up with a punch. I forgot to mention, each man, much like in New Japan, has one corner man. Yes. And Jericho, since his brother Dustin was not available, they took him out. Cody. Excuse me, Cody, since Dustin was not available, takes uh, his best friend, MJF. Yeah. And Jericho, of course, picks his hired muscle, Jake Hager. So Hager breaks up the figure four with a punch to the head. Jericho's pushed into Hager, but then when Cody is shoved through the ropes, Hager punches him again. Finally, referee Aubrey sees this. She ejects Hager. He is thrown out. And MJF, of course, can't resist but taunt this man, laugh at him, wave goodbye, so Hager beats the hell out of him. While this is going on, in the ring, Jericho does the Eddie Guerrero belt shot to the head. Where you hit the guy with a belt, throw it away, and then you sell two, so the referee has no idea what's going on. He goes to finish with the Judas effect, but Cody blocks it, hits crossroads for two. They do a big giant punch exchange, which leads to the famous Rhodes family flip, flop, and fly. They counter each other's moves for a bit. Jericho goes all Hogan with a weight belt, whipping Cody over and over again. Cody took a savage beating in this match, bleeding from the head, welts all over his body. He goes for a top rope Rana, but Jericho turns it into the Boston Crab. Cody's in dire, dire straits. He's able to get out one time, but Jericho goes right back to it, steps in the head with a big, nasty neck crank, and MJF grabs that towel, and he's begging Jericho to fight free, and he's begging, and he's begging, and Cody can't escape, and MJF is forced to throw in the towel. That ends the match. Chris Jericho is still your world heavyweight champion. Cody is done, and he can never challenge for this title again. And he better not. This is a beautiful pro wrestling match. This is awesome. So when MJF throws in that towel, there's a lot of there's so many different things they can do from here because if Cody would have been reaching for the ropes and MJF threw in the towel, you would have known immediately this was a heel turn. Yes. Reality was Cody was not reaching for the ropes. He wasn't getting out. He was screwed. So really, like that's a big aspect of the story here. Like, everybody's mad at MJF for throwing in the towel, but, I mean, there is no evidence Cody was getting out. Right. So, hopefully MJF mentions that in his promo. So, MJF gets in the ring, and when he first threw in the towel, and I've been thinking of all of the different finishes for this, he threw the towel in to end the match, and my first thought was, oh, this is going to get the wrong kind of heat. We have been screwed out of this finish that we paid all of this money for. But alas, I was incorrect. He gets in there. Cody's all sad. MJF is is in tears. He's, yeah, MJF he's, was weeping. He's apologizing profusely. I'm sorry. Fans chant, you fucked up at MJF. Cody stands up. Because Cody is the greatest baby face. And because Cody, I guess, realized I wasn't getting out. He accepts MJF's apology. He accepts his apology and begins to pat him on the shoulder, and MJF boots him right in the nuts. It was perfect. It was perfect timing. He waited until Cody forgave him to kick him in the nuts. Yes. Cody falls down. Fans are furious. MJF is leaving. He gets pelted with a drink. Security drags this guy out. I actually am not sure whether this was or was not a plant. I've heard actually both sides. But anyway, all that matters is Cody is in the ring and he's all forlorn and they fade to black. He's lost his best friend and he's lost the chance to challenge for the title. So I'm kind of torn about this. For the, the, what they did was awesome. 
The only question I have is, was this the right time? Hey, listen, you can you can argue either way. Yes. If you think I, I, it was too and, early, and I'm going to, but go ahead. You're right. Yeah. Because you just started watching, right? Yeah. So it's too early. Mm. If you've been watching since All In, if you've been watching Being the Elite, if you've been watching everything that they have put out, it's not too early. But that is only a portion of their audience. So anybody that wants to tell me that they felt that this was not the right time, I am not going to say, I think you're wrong. I disagree. You are very welcome to that opinion. Because the whole idea of TV is to create a new audience. And to that audience, this was way too early. Well, I would also point out, the, 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 because of the way they did this finish, which I thought was brilliant, it, it's like you say, it was not obvious that MJF was screwing Cody. No. He may have been, he may have been trying to do the best thing to help his friend. And they could have played this off to at least one more big show with Cody trusting MJF, everyone warning Cody about MJF, but Cody standing by his friend, and then MJF stabs him in the back. Now, the flip side of this is, if you do this, Cody does come off looking kind of stupid. Yeah. So we all knew it was coming. The longer you prevent it or, or postpone that, the stupider Cody looks as the one guy who didn't know MJF was going to eventually stab him in the back. So, like I say, I'm torn on that. But they decided to do it here, and once they decided to do it here, it was perfect. So that's cool. And, and that the was the end of the pay-per-view. <laughs> officially, Technically, that was the end of the it was. pay-per-view. Yes. If you just stick around for what was next, which AEW takes no responsibility for, John Moxley versus Kenny I Omega in a lights-out match. Well, where to begin? A couple things. Well, I'll start with before the match. I forgot how not good Justin Roberts is at being a ring announcer. What? Kenny Omega. Two words. Wow. You're the first person I've ever heard say that they didn't like Justin Roberts and as then, a ring announcer. Ja Yon Moxley. Two words. Ja Yon. His name is John. So, like immediately, immediately, Moxley rolls outside and says into the camera, quote, it's time for some fucking garbage wrestling. And that is what we got. They did a bunch of insane stuff with weapons. Do if you he, realize I actually had people arguing me that, with me that he didn't say that? Ja Yon Moxley? No, the unsanctioned is time for some fucking garbage wrestling. That's what he said. That's what was his exact words. Into the camera. Yes. Point blank, staring at the lens. So, they did a lot of crazy and insane shit. They also did a lot of shit that we see all the time, especially because we've been watching the retro Raws and Nitros. I have seen 7,000 guys get hit in the head with trash cans. I don't care about it anymore. My biggest problem with this match, aside from the fact that I don't necessarily like to see guys torture each other like this, it seemed to go, like, rather than start with the mildly violent stuff and then build with the super insane crazy violence, it started with crazy insane violence, and they got very mundane for a while. Then they did something crazy, and then something insane. So it didn't build to anything. And after a while, I was just like, oh, look, there's more bloodletting. I don't care. I've seen it. Take it home. I was bored by all the carnage. Well, I think that's one of the big things right here. There's a lot of people arguing about whether they like this match or not. I did not like this match for two reasons. Uh, the, the violent related reason that I didn't like this match is there was obviously some stuff in this match that was not real. I don't think the glass was real. I don't think the barbed wire spider web whatever thing i think that was fake barbed wire but it was abundantly clear that the barbed wire baseball bat yep. and the barbed wire broom were yep. real yes okay so if you like to see dudes like really get punctured like okay i don't my main problem with the barbed wire stuff is john moxley and kenny omega like five minutes into this match, they puncture their bodies with barbed wire. There's holes all over their body with blood coming out of it. Okay? Including the head and neck. Then they proceed to take bumps in a dirty ring yeah. and on the filthy arena floor. Also true. One of these guys missed the last event <laughs> because he had a serious infection. Staph infection. Okay. Yeah. This is really stupid. It okay. Is. So 
there was a lot of stuff in this match. It's like, I've seen so many great uh, Kenny Omega matches. I've seen so many great uh, John Moxley matches since he left WWE. They'd have a 5,000 times better match than this spectacle. Mm-hmm. Now, on top of that, I had to, I, I started blocking anybody that used the word boomer. I don't, I don't care if it's your meme or whatever. Like, if I, if I saw boomer on my timeline, you were blocked yesterday. This has nothing to do with whether or not I like this style of wrestling, okay? I'm sure if you go back in the archives, you can find multiple examples involving Abyss, the Hell of War match, where I have said, I am not a fan of this kind of wrestling, but for what it was, this was an excellent match. I can't even tell you how many times I've said that. My biggest problem with this match was it wasn't a very good match. It really wasn't. Regardless of whether it was a hardcore match and they hit each other with bats or they fell into barbed wire or whatever, it was a 40-minute match where they just did stuff for 40 minutes. Yeah. Nothing built to anything else. Nope. It was just a random collection of things. You hit me with this. I hit you with that. You fall into this. I fall into that. I was just like, the match wasn't very good. That's yeah. the bigger issue to me. Yeah, I got very bored with it. Uh, and then they started closing with stuff I've seen before. They, they closed with the taking off the canvas and the exposing the wood, which I've seen in NXT, saw in Impact. It's all been done before. I'm just waiting for them to just light each other on fire and be done with it. And finally, Moxley wins. I will say the double arm brainbuster onto the wood was the scariest thing they did, and that should have been the finish. But yeah, the, 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 it was just it was. At least twice as long as it needed to be. It was not put together well, and the fact that the craziest stuff, a lot of the craziest stuff was at the beginning, and then they calmed it down for a while, and then I got very bored. Went on forever. Moxley won. And my last words in my note here were, the Hell of War match was way, way better than this. And more violent. And you know, more violent. So so don't even tell me this is a violence thing. Yeah. I'd also like to, I can't even believe I'm doing this, but I'm going to examine the psychology of this unsanctioned match. They bring out this barbed wire spider web gimmick, and they do a suplex off the ramp into all of this barbed wire. Yeah. Okay. So then a bunch of AEW employees come out to get him out of it. What? I... This is an unsanctioned match. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. If these two idiots suplex no. themselves into a bunch of barbed wire, and they, it's their job to get themselves out. Why is AEW getting him out of the barbed wire? I don't know. I was, I was, I ridiculed that. They should have got themselves out. Yeah. They got themselves into it. They got to get themselves out of it. Yeah, I was not blown away by this match. Quite frankly, I pretty much hated it. And I think it's not what they need to do to build this audience. This is the, well, yeah, that too. I, but I hope they got it out of their system. The story I heard was that John Moxley really wanted to do a match like this. He was never going to be able to do it in WWE. They let him do it, and it's done. Did Omega also want to? Well, Omega's done stuff like this before. All right. I mean, I'm, they, clearly they both wanted to do it. Well, that, They're doing it, all sorts of crazy bullshit. Touche. But, but. I mean, you know, I, I think it's done. Yeah. I think they did it, and they're done with it. I'm sure there's still going to be lights-out matches. I'm sure there's still going to be unsanctioned matches. Dude, we just saw Omega and Joey Janela that I thought was a pretty good match, actually, which was also a crazy unsanctioned match. So they're going to do it, but I don't think you're going to see things like this on a regular basis. I could be wrong. Let's show everybody. Yeah. So this brings us to AEW Dynamite, also November 6th, 2019. Maybe it's just because I've been watching these Nitro pay-per-view recaps where I never have any idea what the hell is happening. But I thought this pay-per-view recap was great. Yeah, they told they us all the matches. They told you who won. They had a much better angle of the replay of Cody smashing his face on the ramp and breaking his face. This poor guy. Now, the one thing about this, because it was a lights-out match, there was no mention of John Moxley and Kenny Omega. They ran down the show. Everything was going to be on this show, including that John Moxley would be in action next. But first, here is a Kenny Omega health update. And they did show some clips from the lights-out match. A little bit. So Omega goes to the doctor. He's got a big-ass shiner, big, big black eye, scars and cuts all over his back. They have still shots of, of, of the action, or, or they did the bit like we'll do the suit, we'll show the suplex into the barbed wire spider web, but, but we'll freeze it before impact. So the doctor examines him, 
looks over everything and tells him it's best to take a week off and be safe. Kenny says, okay. He's about to leave, but he asks, how did, how did Mox do? The doctor says, he was pretty beat up, but he is cleared. And Kenny says, all right. He is very disappointed. He is, yes. He's that, demoralized. Yes, and... and He's here with Michael Nakazawa, his he, buddy. Yes, and he says, I'm sorry. Which leads to John Moxley versus Michael Nakazawa. This was so simple and so perfect. His friend, his friend Michael Nakazawa, mm-hmm. comedy wrestler, baby oil. He gets in the ring, he holds up the baby oil, he tosses it aside, he attacks John Moxley. He knows, I can't win, but I must try to defend my friend. Exactly. And he goes down in flames. <laughs> well, this a- is a friend. <laughs> we a- have friends in AEW. God damn it, Thank we do. Thank God. They had a very competitive... I've been waiting decades for friends. A very competitive one-minute match, and then Moxley grabbed him, hit the paradigm shift out of nowhere, and pinned him. Now, they actually they fixed it after this, but for this segment, this ring was way over Like, every step they took walking around the ring, a herd of buffalo was running through the building, it sounded like. So then Moxley cuts a promo. Boy, did Moxley cut a promo. First, he makes sure this one counts, because he's so bitter about the lights-out match being a lights-out match. He is not a liar. He told us what would happen at Full Gear. He delivered. Kenny Omega will never be the same. But, despite all, all our personal differences, I do respect Kenny Omega for having the balls that nobody else will have the balls to do anymore. Nobody else will ever step in the ring with me, he says. I guess ignoring that Michael Nakazawa just did. I need to make sure this child's okay. Last scream. It's a long promo. You have time to go. Yeah, go through this promo. I'll make sure everything's... So Moxley talks about how there's no one in the locker room who will face him. He promises to get people in the ring. He will break everyone's neck until he's the last man standing. Calls out the entire roster. But before you accept, he says, do me a favor. Kiss your family goodbye. Have an ambulance on speed dial. And don't ask for an apology. And the place goes crazy. And they're all screaming and and going nuts. And he's such a star. And I remember... I think it was double or nothing. The first time Granny laid eyes on John Moxley here in AEW. And she noted he looked like Dean Ambrose. And we laughed at her. And I owe Granny an apology. Because though we explained to her at the time that John Moxley and Dean Ambrose were the same guy, I'm no longer sure that's true. I know it's the same person. She's just but a little crabby. He's got She's better witchy. He's got a better body. He's got better gear. He's got better presence. He's doing better promos. He's got better confidence. Everything about this guy is light years better than it was in World Wrestling Entertainment. Does this surprise you? The 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 How many people have we seen in XT yeah. that were fabulous? They yeah. call up to the main roster and they were just like geeks. The, All of them. Yes. The 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 fact that he's better does not surprise me, but the, the gap between before and after is massive. He, he he came off here like a guy who could be the biggest star in the Dude, country. Dude, did you watch that NXT UK pay-per-view that Finn Balor was on? I don't think so. He so. was a thousand times better than he was on the main roster, just wrestling in NXT UK. Hmm. So yes, that's what the main roster does to everybody. <laughs> it ruined them all. The Dark Order versus the Jurassic Express... We need more background on both these teams. We need some promos or some skits or some video packages or something. Dude, we might, but like, Marco, place is going crazy for him chanting his name. They're chanting the Jungle Boy. They're, they hate the Dark Order. This was like the babyface tag team versus heel tag team match. There was a couple of spots that were a little wacky, but I mean, in general, like, These fans loved the Jurassic Express. They hated the Dark Order. It was the easiest match in the world. Women screaming as they're beating on the Jungle Boy. It's like, here's another one. I've been waiting 30 years for the women to scream when a guy's getting beaten up again. Finally, we got somebody that they're doing that for. It was was good. I liked it. On top of all that, it was perfectly put together because the baby faces are tiny. I mean... Jungle Boy is in like the 10th percentile of pro wrestler size. He's The 10th? <laughs> Can we try the, the tooth? Well, he's still much, much bigger than Marco. So point being... Oh, the Jungle Boy. I thought you were talking about Marco. Yes. 
Well, I said Jungle Boy, which is actually, a key. believe it or not, there's something about Jungle Boy, his physique, that actually makes him look smaller than he is. Okay. He's, he's he's a wiry guy. When I when I went down for the match with him, like I wasn't I did not think that he was going to be as small as Marco, but I was expecting like I'm going to do the bully gimmick again. This is a small skinny dude. Then I get there and he's bigger than I am. Yeah. So things changed. So he's he's not as small as he appears to be. He's just got a he's got a juvenile physique cuz he's young and face. Yeah. So but point being, they were much, much smaller than the Dark Order. And so, well, that's for sure. So when they were on offense, it was perpetual motion. Because that's, the, that's kind of the whole point of tag team wrestling, is that within the rules of the match, it gives smaller men a chance to compete if they work together and cohesively and function as a unit and do constant double teams, which is what they were doing here. And boy, I, let me tell you, I mentioned this last week, but I can't tell you what an improvement it is now that they covered up Evil Uno's upper body. Mm -hmm. I can actually watch these matches now and not just be totally taken out of it by this guy's physique. That's a fair point. Yeah. That's a fair point. He's a good worker. He's a very... Dude, this guy can move. It's just his his physique. And and they figured out... It was distracting. Put a shirt on the guy. And it's all better. He's still big. You you can can focus on the match now. So... (laughs) In a company full of comic book nerds, Grayson may be the biggest of them all. I know it's a shock that a guy in the Dark Order is a comic book nerd. But not only is his name Grayson, but his finisher is a giant over-the-head backbreaker called the Nightfall. Which is... Trust me, Brian. It's a comic book reference. I promise you. So... You can't figure that out? <laughs> the Nightfall? Do you know specific reference, No, Brian? I don't. But Bane, I mean... in a storyline called Nightfall, used a backbreaker on Batman oh. to break his back. Yes. Are you kidding me? That happened. A backbreaker? It's, 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 this is the exact same move. It's ridiculous. It, you can, I'll, I'll get I, the, no, I believe you. Yeah. It's just preposterous. That's how you take out Batman? Well, a after, backbreaker? After uh, using all of Arkham Asylum to wear him down first. Mm. Yeah. It's a great story. Regardless, match is totally fun. The uh, Dark Order... I started to say this. We still don't really know why these small guys like dinosaurs so much, or why these larger guys... Why, why do they have creepers? Who are they? What's going on there? So we need some storyline there. But they hit the fatality, which is exactly the same as the street sweeper just turned around uh, for the win. It was a hell of a tag match right here. You know, normally I ask for more backstories. I mean, let's be fair. I've gone nuts about how I know nothing about this hangman. Yeah. But like... It is the same thing, actually. I don't need that for the, the well, okay. Jurassic Express and the Dark Order. Of course the Dark Order has creepers. <laughs> right? <laughs> It's le- well. It's also less important for some mid card tag teams than a guy who's hovering just below me in event level and says a single. That is and listen, true. they got a guy in a dinosaur mask that, for whatever reason, everybody just decided he's the greatest wrestler they've ever seen. <laughs> he happens to have Tarzan with him. It's a boy in his dinosaur. I don't need anything else. Yeah, it's self explanatory. So Evil Uno does get to cu- cut a promo here. Puts Marco over. Talks about how he's always undersized. I can't believe I'm saying this, but they should have used the nails gimmick for his voice. <laughs> it did not match. Or Kane. He puts Marco over and says, I can, give you, I can give you purpose. And he offers a mask and says, be one with the Dark Order. And Jungle Boy, before Marco can say anything, Jungle Boy steps in and says, no, we already have a mask. Because... Marco is now wearing a mask, or at least down to the ring, wearing a mask like Luchasaurus. I couldn't help but notice that when he handed Marco that mask, Marco was going for it. There, there, this and is, Jungle Boy stopped it. Yes. There, this, there's more to come here. Seeds are being sown. So, Evil Uno says, I respect that. Put him down. And the creepers attack. I'm sure these creepers are nice guys. <laughs> this was a horrible, <laughs> They're just, horrible beating. Just a few creepers. So... As Ross notes, it would be wonderful if someone would come to help. And so out comes, in his big return, Luchasaurus. And so the the biggest pet peeve I think everyone has with AEW, too many goddamn fan shots. For example, when your dinosaur is returning, just show me the dinosaur. So he comes out. He they just, have had a few fan shots where it's like, they're just sitting there. That too. Like, why did you cut to the people? Uh, these people were at least going nuts, but just let me see where they're going nuts at. Yes. 
So he destroys all the creepers. He destroys Grayson. Evil Uno flees. He looked great here, Luchasaurus did. Kind of. And he's still hurt. Well, he worked through it. So, and then they all pose. The Jurassic Express all pose. As long as we're making comic book references, it's Moon Boy and Devil Dinosaur here in 2019. They all hugged. Everyone popped. And then... Best friends were furious. And and, and the... Uh, uh, Marco, he like turns to Luchasaurus and says, well, since you're back, you can have this mask back. And Lucha says, no, you put that on. And he gave Marco his blessing. One of the announcers called him Baby Saurus, which is perfect. This is a great segment. <laughs> so Sean Spears and the librarian Peter Avalon are in the ring for something. And Avalon, they're in Nashville, and he's cutting a promo on Nashville music. And he says, I think Jason Aldean and Johnny Cash. And this promo just stops and Darby's music plays. And the best touch they have here is they've timed the entrance now to as Justin Roberts starts his introduction, Darby Allen begins to skate to the ring. And Justin says, skating to the ring out of Seattle, Washington. It's perfect. So we had a three-way. Sean Spears versus Peter Avalon versus Darby Allen. Two minutes in, Joey Janela appears and begins to brawl with Sean Spears and they vanish. Why? I saw them have a pay-per-view match. Sean the Spears speed must continue. hit him with his move and pinned him. What's left to settle? I don't understand. It left Darby and Avalon alone one-on-one uh, -on -one in the ring. And then what exactly should have happened happened. Darby, who is... I am still appalled by Darby Allen's ring gear, but his he is so graceful. He is so elegant. In the ring. And he's another a, one of those guys where it's like, what do you want him in trunks and boots? It's Darby Allen. I want him to not have anything other than long black tights tucked into shoes that Daisy Dukes. Who cares? I do. He's Darby Allen. He absolutely is. He looks great. He has a flipping stunner thing and a coffin drop, coffin drop and wins. And he cuts a promo where he just says, John Moxley, I accept. Place goes crazy. It was great. I was terrified. <laughs> Someone is going to die. Entirely possible. John Moxley and Darby Allen next week. One thing I noticed on this show, I talked about how over Marco and and Jungle Boy were. Same thing with Darby. It's like people just going crazy with these Darby chants. It feels like these guys are starting to get over. It feels yeah. like television is working and they're getting guys over. That's the point of television. That's by a the great way. point. Yes, I know. If you watch WWE, you think the point of television is to bury everybody, to humiliate your the talent. The idea yes. is to get them over, to create stars. And it did feel watching this that these people are starting to get over. Yeah. On that note, Nyla Rose versus Danny Jordan. They had an effective squash match, and Nyla won with the Beast Bomb. It was just a segment. Yep. A Dustin Rhodes medical update. He is still a couple of weeks away from training, three or four weeks away from returning. And they show the footage of Hager breaking He's his doing arm. better than Killian Dane. Yes. And Adam Cole. Breaking his arm in the car door. Next week, everyone. A dynamite dozen battle royal. Yes. Okay. So here's the... This is better than the lethal lottery, the London lethal lottery. That's for sure. On uh, Nitro. There's a 12-man battle royal. When it gets down to two, the match stops. Those two will meet a week later. With a prestigious prize at stake. A big trophy. Medals we've seen on this show. No. A diamond ring. Yes. You know, when I heard about this, I was so disappointed that WWE didn't come up with this. Because as much as I hate this stupid Lana Lashley Rusev storyline, if they just out of nowhere announced a dynamite dozen battle royal where the final two will fight for a diamond ring... It could come down to Lashley and Rusev. And Rusev could win. Lashley wins, okay. and then he gives the diamond ring to Lana. I was going to say, yeah. Oh. The, the point is, whoever gets the diamond ring gives it to Lana, and she goes for them because it's a diamond ring. Yes, yeah. yes. That would have made sense, Brian. I mean, the only person <laughs> I can think of here is maybe Peter Avalon proposes to Blue Pants. I suppose. But I can't imagine that's where they're going. <laughs> I have no idea what the point of having a diamond ring at stake is. Maybe Jericho will uh, propose... To Sammy? Sammy, because <laughs> they had that moment last they, week. They might, they might. Tony Schiavone interviews Allie, who is number four in the rankings. She has shown what she can do on Dark. She wants to do it on Dynamite. And then the lights go out. 
which is a very common thing on AEW. There's Dynamite. a lot of a lot of power issues on this show. I've noticed. Well, Sean Spears comes out. Let's go out. Awesome Kong. Let's go out. It's the third one. I think it's later. So Brandy or me, uh, Allie attacks Kong. It goes badly, and Awesome Kong beats her up, and Brandy takes some of her hair, and that's that. Best thing on the show is about to happen. Ah, oh, I, I, the I, greatest. I, 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 I'm having trouble talking about it because I'm smiling so big. Jericho comes out for a promo in th- this sparkly blue smoking jacket. Where did he get this? It's amazing. Pretty sure he can afford to custom make some of this. I'd like to think so. Attire. I would like to think so. He brags about still being the champion. He wants a thank you, not from these hillbilly jackasses in Nashville, from people that matter. The management and all the wrestlers in the back. He begins to list all the men he has beaten. Calls Cody an entitled millennial son of a bitch. And then, yes, the lights went out. So, this time, it's Cody's music plays, but of course it's MJF doing Cody's entrance. By the way, have you ever actually listened to Cody's song? I just put it up on YouTube. I mean, I've heard it a million times. The, cho- the chorus is okay. The, the the verses are like the worst lyrics ever. Wow. It, it's up there with I'm an ass man. Seriously. <laughs> that's, that's impossible. It's, it's quite horrible. So as MJF is coming out, Tony Schiavone notes, you can remove the J if you ask me. I love that line. <laughs> Schiavone is the greatest. MJF says, Christopher, buddy, I'll talk to you in a minute. I have something to get, I'll get off my chest. And Le Champion yielded the floor. Yeah, he just steps back and watches this guy tear it up. He was 23 years old. Yeah. Um, I know I I think the first time I mentioned on this show was a Double or Nothing when I said MGF is going to be massively huge. Uh, every time I see him given the spotlight, I become more and more convinced of that fact. MGF is going to be massively huge, everyone. Like, he is now. He's going to be much bigger. He's going to be a mega, mega, mega star. First of all, Brian, he addresses one of the points you raised on Sunday. Had I not thrown the towel in, he said, Cody's career would be over. Yes. Because Cody was trapped. But more importantly, he wants people to know that you have been cheering for the real villain this whole time. Cody couldn't give less of a shit about any of you, he says. The real Cody only cares about himself. Cody is a liar. Cody is a user. Cody is an abuser who took a kid from Long Island and made him his puppet. And that sociopath said, Hey, kid, I want to be your mentor. What he really wanted to do, he wanted to give me a, I think he said a helping hand. He wanted to use his thumb to hold me down. Keep keep me under his thumb, he says. It was, you don't want to take me under your wing. He tried to hold me under his thumb. But your thumb can't hold me down. You were looking at the new face of AEW. Cody Rhodes, I am better than you and you know it. He goes to address... Jericho, but the crowd is chanting Cody too loudly. So MGF says, chant his name all you want. He's not here. He doesn't care about you. (laughs) He turns to Christopher and says, I am a huge fan of yours. If I had a Mount Rushmore of wrestling, you'd be the third or fourth face on my Mount Rushmore. Jericho was satisfied. (laughs) He took that as a compliment. So they go back and forth about the inner circle. The joke is at first, uh, Cody's or excuse me, MJF is asking, do you want me in the inner circle? And Jericho replies, do you want to be in it? Neither one wants to be the guy to say what they want. They want the other guy to say they want what they want each other first. Finally, finally, MJF says, you've been drinking that bubbly too much. To think I need you is odd. I'm sure you'd like me to join your inner inner circle, jerk. An amazing line right there. So Jericho says MJF wants to be like him so badly. It's like your parents got horny while I was beating up Juventud Guerrera, and nine months later you popped out. Place is going crazy for this inside joke and this dig. This dig. <laughs> MJF asks, "Who the hell is Hoovy?" And Jericho pats him on the shoulder and says, "Google it, baby. Google it." So they keep going back and forth. Neither will commit. It seems like they are about to come to blows when suddenly they agree that the biggest jackass in AEW is Cody Rhodes. <laughs> Ah, they all cackle together. MGF, MGF, who hates everyone, just says, I like you. You're a good guy. Cody finally appears. He charges. 
He lays out Jericho. He botches the power slam the first time, which they sell us because he's injured. Hits it the second time. Jericho vanishes. He's about to finish off MGF when Wardlow. <laughs> yes, Wardlow debuted. We have seen one video package of this yes. guy. He was a every generic big strong muscle head you ever saw. Now he's out here in a suit. So you I can't even tell baffled. he's a muscle head. I was baffled because the announcers were talking about how we'd seen vignettes for Wardlow for months. And I mean, I'm sure there were on other shows or whatever, but like we saw okay. one on TV. The, One. It's bad to assume that your entire fan base is also watching Dark and watching Being the Elite and whatever else you're doing on YouTube. Assume they are only watching Dynamite. Yeah. So anyway, he's got a suit on, beats up Cody, hangs him with a tie, and uh, eventually they are separated. Does it? Do I need to say this was an amazingly great segment? No, the segment was awesome. It was a high point of the show. Yes. High point of the show in terms of viewers, high point of the show in terms of Quality. promos. Yeah. MJF there going toe to toe with Chris Jericho. It's just unbelievably great. This was the AEW equivalent of Chris Jericho debuting on Raw and being right there with the, right there with the Rock. Yes. Now it, it wasn't MJF's debut, obviously, but this was his breakout, and he was hanging with Jericho and fit right in. It was fantastic. So I mentioned this earlier about Sean Spears and George Nella. Hangman Page versus Pack. Now, I love Pac. Heyman Page is very good, and they have great chemistry together, but what's the point of this match? I just saw them wrestle on pay-per-view. I realized, I mean, they're doing, I, I, I was flabbergasted. When they announced the match, I was like, okay. I had many thoughts. So, Hangman, when he did the cowboy shit promo, and then he beat Pac at the pay-per-view. Like, I've been very critical of the Hangman. And after the pay-per-view, I was like, okay, now we're where we want to be with this Hangman. Then I hear they're doing a Hangman versus Pac in a rematch on Wednesday. And I was like, okay, so hold on a second. Pac has been on, like, a win streak. And this was his first big loss. So, like, you're either going to beat him again or all this work you did on Hangman... Yeah. You're going to 50-50 him and have Pac win? I'm like, what? They don't do DQs. I, I couldn't imagine them doing another draw this early. I was like, what's the point? So I watched the match, and the match is very good. And they're, this is awesome, Chance. And they do this bizarre finish where Hangman is just winning. The, I thought the finish in a vacuum was awesome. Kind of. It, it, Hangman's winning, and as he's winning, the ref kind of gets in the way, but only for a second. And Pac boots him in the face. And then he boots him in the face again. And then he kicks him in the head. And the ref's about to DQ him, but they don't do DQs. And then Pac goes up top, hits the black arrow, puts him in the brutalizer, and the ref stops it. I'm like, so did you concuss him with a boot? Like, you stopped all of his momentum with one boot. And then, like, you booted him a few times, and then hit your move and brutalized him or whatever. But anyway, point is, whatever I was thinking going in, when it was over, I thought the exact same thing. What was the point of this? I don't, I don't know. They finally got Hangman where I thought that he needed to be, and then they just beat him. I have no idea what they're doing with the other guy. Now, I, I want to talk more about this finish, because like I say, in a vacuum, I thought this finish was awesome, because Pac had gone for the brain buster on the chair, like he did in the pay-per-view, but... Page reversed it, hit a brain buster on the floor. Now, Pac still kicked out back in the ring, but he was woozy. And so there was, briefly, a moment where Pac was each to the corner, and the ref holds Page back so he can make, make sure that Pac is, can still defend himself. Page, being a sportsman, allows the ref to check. Then, Pac comes out of the corner, boots Page in the head, and Page goes down, he's dead. He's on his face. Arms are to the sides. He's not moving. He's dead. And the ref tries to hold Pack back, but Pack is not a sportsman. He's a bastard. And so he gets more aggressive when the guy is defenseless. And he beats him and beats him and stomps him and stomps him. Honestly, the 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 big knockout kick, if they had just done a knockout finish, I'd have been fine with that. But he hit his big move and put a submission move on him and he, a submission move on him and he won. Like I say, in a vacuum, a totally cool finish, but for what they've been doing with these two guys, I have no idea what the point of any of this is. And then the announcers were like, well, Pac has won this, he didn't say feud, 
but he said something like Pac has has finished this finished off this rivalry or something like that. Like it's done. So Pac's the one that's going up in this feud. So when they said that, then it was kind of like, well, if Pac was going to go up in this feud, why did he even do one job for the Hangman? Oh no, that's WWE thing. Yeah, that's like, well, you know, we got to Hangman's going to lose this feud, but we got to give him a win in here. Which, you know, I mean, in theory it sounds fine, but the reality is they gave him that win and they took it right away from him. And so now Hangman is lower than he was before he even went into the pay-per-view. Yeah. So this was a baffling decision, the more I think about it. No. Last night I was kind of like, well, you know, they've done 50-50 this one time. It's been five weeks. Who cares? But what I really think about it, it's like, this is Hangman Page and Pac. And I don't even understand why they 50 50 I don't even get it. All of this, and you're not even mentioning the fact they undercut their own pay-per-view finish. Yeah. If you buy a pay-per-view to see a decisive uh, you know, point in the story, you bought it, and page one, you think, okay, great, page is the better man. Four days later, or whatever it is, page is not the better man, and you wasted some part of your money buying that pay-per-view to see that finish. Yeah, I didn't like this. It's just, I, I don't understand. We cut backstage with the Young Bucks and Proud and Powerful are having a backstage brawl. Uh, somebody does a big dive off the forklift. I think it was Santana. Could be wrong. I, I need to learn their names. So they're doing this giant brawl, and somebody goes flying into the men's room door. Santana did the dive. Santana did the dive. I was right. Uh, they go they go flying into the men's room door, which opens, and Orange Cassidy is in the men's room, leaning against the wall, hands in his pockets, just hanging out in the bathroom. And Santana is creeped out. He reaches out, and he slowly closes the door, and the brawl continues. That was funny. So, I don't know what he was doing with his hands in his pockets in that bathroom. Right, that's we, the bigger That's issue. why Santana was creeped out. Mm. That's why he wanted to close the door. There's nothing there he wanted to see. They go out on stage. They take the loaded sock to Jeff's knee. They throw Matt through the stage. It was a good brawl, but here again, for far too often, it's occurring to me as I go through these notes, I'm left asking, what was the point of this? Proud and Powerful beat them at the pay-per-view. They already had the heat. Now they come out here in a brawl and beat them up again. Like, are the Bucks being written off the show? No, but they they need some wins. Yeah. <laughs> so, I don't know. Brandon Cutler, Cutler is there. He gets beaten up, too. And finally, Private Party chases them away. And very quickly, we learn it's Private Party versus Proud and Powerful next week. There was a lot of peas in that match. And along with, of course, Moxley versus Darby Allen. You know, the thing with all of the elite guys losing and losing and losing and losing... I mean, the reality is they were all like the biggest non-WWE stars in wrestling. So, yeah, I watched this show and I can't figure out why, like, the elite can't win. <laughs> they like they like catch a win every now and then, and it's it's kind of ridiculous when you hear the announcers talking about how Young Bucks are arguably the greatest tag team in the world. And you're like, they are. They they they've lost more than they've won. They're not the tag team champions. Like, what are you talking about? They lost the big match at the pay-per-view. Yeah. But the thing is, here's the thing that I've learned in wrestling, okay? They're losing more than they should, but, you know, there's a reason that they were the biggest stars outside of WWE and all of wrestling. Like, it'll take three weeks of them on a win streak, and they will be mega over. That is also true. This is not a disaster. It's just kind of baffling. Because you would think that you've got a brand new audience. They have the biggest potential to be stars because they were stars before there was television. So you should be pushing them harder. But I think in their minds, it's like, we're going to use whatever star power we've got now to get these new guys over. Because we do need new guys over. This can't just be the elite. We've got to get everybody over. And once we get some guys over, then, hey, we can become stars again. It's not like, this is not like they're, they're uh, who the hell's getting that tag team match? Such a big match, I can't even remember. Proud and Powerful? No, on WWE. Oh, Ryder and Hawkins. Ryder and Hawkins. It's the Edgeheads. Like, They're not the Edgeheads. So, we go to the main event, SCU versus Chris Jericho and Sammy Guevara, which I guess it was a title match. Yeah, because they were talking about Jericho winning double titles. So, SCU got to do their promo on Dynamite for the, Dynamite for the first time. So, it's weird. It's like... This is the worst town we've ever been in. If, if this is the first is, time... Is over. Yeah. But, like, this is a new audience. Yeah. 
And I'm not sure how many of the people that went to this building had seen this act before. But, like, they love these guys, and then they come out, and they bury the town. And it kind of gets a pop, but it's a weird pop. And then, like, they, and then they try to walk it back. We hate this town, but we love you people. Yeah, it's just weird. So, a couple of things going on here. First of all... Well, let me get this out of the way first. Right. Because I, I must be a fair man. Mm-hmm. They got the heat during the break. Mm. I hate that! Yeah. And this is not something that cannot be easily remedied. Get the heat and then go to the break. They did it on NXT. And WWE is not known for doing this. So if NXT can do it, I'm positive AEW can do it. <laughs> yes. So... Most important takeaway, I, I think, is that Sammy Guevara, I looked it up, he's 26 years old, which is actually much older than I thought. He looks like he's 17. Yes. <laughs> he's, he, seriously, he's, he's 10 years older than he looks. But he's in there with Scorpio Sky, Frankie Gazarian, and Chris Jericho. I looked this up as well. A combined total of 67 years of pro wrestling experience between those three men. He fit right in. Yeah, he's, he's great. He's smooth as glass. He's fantastic. He's only going to get better. So, one thing in this match that actually did make me very, very angry. They're wrestling along, and Excalibur points out, folks, this is a championship match. It's a 60-minute time limit. If we run out of TV time, we'll put the finish on YouTube. Okay, hang on. Two or three weeks ago. No, no, no. I can explain this. Okay. This is a title match. So it must be 60 minutes. Well, the title match, they want to finish. If it's just a random, nothing happening match, it's TV time remaining. I think that's the rule. Well, that's still... For all the... I'm just telling you. For all the storm and vitriol over the time limit draw, we had... It was Pac and Moxley, right? It was Moxley and somebody. Yeah, it was Pac. Yeah. So now they just announce whenever we want to... We can do whatever time limit we want and show you the finish later. Well, they've done this for every title match. For the title match, that's not the rule. It's only for non-title matches. Well, why why, why is it the rule, then? I I don't know. Then make it the rule for standard matches. Whatever your time limit is, we're doing that, even if it goes past the TV time. Anyway. Because it left me thinking, what was the point of doing the draw in the uh, Paxley-Moxley match? So you know that they will do draws sometimes to try to get heat. But then sometimes they won't. (laughs) But as... The title match has a 60-minute time limit. The other ones have TV time remaining. That's that's it. That's all. On pay-per-view, they'll all have time limits. But on TV, if there's a non-title main event, it's just TV time remaining. That's this. That's... I understand that. I'm just saying they shouldn't do it. Well, okay. okay. You're allowed that opinion. I'm allowed that opinion. So, if you go to the finish, SCU goes for SCU later, but Hager breaks it up and lays out Kazarian. Daniels dives on the Hager. He gets killed. <laughs> this poor guy. <laughs> he got beat up a lot on this show. Uh, so Jericho and Sky are left alone in the ring. And it's all really, really cool stuff. Jericho hits the code breaker out of nowhere. It's not the finish. Scorpio Sky kicks out. And then shortly thereafter, he grabs him and hooks the small package of death. And Scorpio Sky pins Chris Jericho. On Dynamite. Can we talk about the thousand reasons this was the greatest finish ever? Yes, that's what we're here for. Well, when Jericho first won the title, he was doing his bobbly celebration backstage, and he just happened to walk by one Scorpio Sky and said, you'll never get a shot at this title. This was like two months ago that they shot that angle. Well, they got Scorpio Sky over by having him wrestle in his tennis shoes, they come out here for this match. And winning the tag tournament. Scorpio Sky is one half of the world tag team champions. He's no geek. One half of the world tag team champions. The world tag team champions are the tag team equivalent of Chris Jericho. Sure. He's the singles champion. They're the tag team champions. He absolutely should have the ability to pin the world champion in a tag team match. That's his specialty. So he goes out there. He pins Chris Jericho. Now they can do a championship match off of this, where, in fact, Chris Jericho has every right to beat Scorpio Sky in a singles match because he's the singles champion beating Scorpio Sky. It got over the tag team champions. This, these tag team champions 
are not the WWE Tag Team Champions that lose to one guy all the time. Sure. These World Tag Team Champions, one of the guys just pinned the World Champion. His first loss. His first loss in AEW. They are valid Tag Team Champions. They are champions. Yes. I will add that Scorpio Sky has now used a small package to defeat the terrifying Lucha Brothers for the World Tag Team titles. Yeah. And he has used the same small package to pin the world champion, Chris Jericho. Yes. He is going to hit this inside cradle, and the place is going to explode now. Yes. When he hits that small package on Chris Jericho, it will be the hottest near fall that entire night on television. Yes, I can't wait. So, yes, that was the finish. Jericho throws a tantrum, starts throwing crap everywhere, and the show goes off the air. Which is great. He was angry. Yes. He did not blow this off like Becky Lynch did on Monday when she got pinned. This was awesome. I think it should be abundantly clear which show I'm voting for this I, week. I, I gave mine away the opening. Yeah. NXT had the best match. AEW was the better show. AEW wins again this week. Mm-hmm. It had a, it, this was This may have been my favorite AEW show yet. It was way up there. It may have been my favorite. You had great wrestling. You had great promos. You had... Uh, you had guys getting over. Got new, new faces getting over. This is everything I want from a wrestling show, really. Yep, the NXT show. Some comedy. NXT is still, it's funny, I, I've mentioned this a thousand times, but it hits me every time. Like, I always have these weird anti-AW people telling me, AW, they're never going to get over, there's no storylines, it's all wrestling. And I, I watch these two shows and it's like, dude, one of these shows is the show where it's like all wrestling. And it's not AEW. Yeah. NXT is just, it's all about trying to do blow-away matches. And when there are promos, they're usually bad. And on AEW, yeah, the matches on AEW were not as good as the matches on NXT. It's been that case almost every week. Has there been a week where the wrestling on AEW was better than the wrestling on NXT? Uh, the best match is usually on NXT for the sure. The best match is almost always on NXT, and look at the ratings. Yeah. It's not about which show is putting on the better matches. And of all promotions to not get it, it's WWE. You know what I'm saying? Yes. The sports entertainment company is the one trying to win this battle with just better wrestling. Better sport. The other show... They're doing interviews. They're doing storylines. I mean, you could follow the storylines back months. They're trying to create stars. They're trying to get people over. You can nitpick this. You can nitpick that. But, you know, the most hated guy in wrestling, Marco Stunt, he comes out at the beginning of his match. There's these loud Marco chants. They're going crazy for Marco. They love the Jungle Boy. They love Darby Allen. MJF is over. Jericho's over. Cody is this gigantic baby face. Like, it's just... It's two totally different things. And the things that people accuse AEW of are actually the things that NXT is doing. So anyway, AEW People on the internet are dumb, Brian. There's a lot of stupid people. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are a lot of stupid people. And they they all have smartphones, unfortunately. That is a very unfortunate fact. All right, we're out of time, everybody. I want to mention that if you go to F4W Mania... Talk about this AEW. Show. AEW Dynamite, also November twentieth of the year two thousand nineteen. So tonight, Brian, uh, we have matches here, which beyond just telling you what matches are on the show and what you can look forward to and all that stuff, is sort of it, it, it's a it's a soft opening for the show. It, it, you you don't have an entrance for a pro, uh, for a match or a promo where suddenly it's, it's like in your face. It's jarring. It's welcome to the show, everyone. Here's what we have in store for you. It's an appetizer. It sets the table. I like this match layout here at the start of the show. Yes, they do this every week. And it's always good. The show opens. There are the friendly announcers. They say, hey, here's what we have coming up tonight. You look at the matches, you go, oh my God, Ray Phoenix, Nick Jackson, that sounds awesome. Mm-hmm. Oh, this this main event with Darby Allin and John Moxley, cool. You're all excited. You got two hours of action coming. They let you know what's coming. Great. So tonight, Brian, we have... Proud and Powerful versus Private Party. A Dynamite Dozen Battle Royal. Darby Allen versus John Moxley in the main event. And our opener, Nick Jackson versus Ray Phoenix. What a match. They had a 20-minute spot and then did a finish. Yeah. 
It was. I loved it. It was overwhelming. It was spectacular. It was breathtaking. It was otherworldly. I wrote at one point. The, the I don't know how to describe it. Except there's a spot where they're in the corner. They are both jumping from rope to rope. Which, as I say it out loud, I realize how absurd it sounds. But they pulled it off. And it's like there's. I don't know if there was two other dudes out there who could have done what they just did here. So, yes, for 20 minutes, they had one giant executed spot, uh, a lot of trading kicks. I know at one point Nick Nick kept going for the super kick, and Phoenix kept finding different ways to counter it. I'm sure at some point Nick finally hit it, but I, frankly, there was so much going on, I lost it. You lost it because Phoenix won the super kick contest, and the moment he won, they cut to some dude's face in the crowd. There's a lot of that going on, too. That, that needs to stop. This is an ongoing problem with uh, with AEW. Too many, too many crowd reaction shots. Yes. Save them for, like, the finish. So, and the end, I also love AEW. Does They do this all the time. NXT, actually, all of WWE has a very formulaic match layout wherein there will be a bunch of near falls, and then one guy will hit one move and win. And AEW mixes that up. They will have somebody hit one move, but the guy kicks out. So they hit a different move, and that one wins. Or they will do what Phoenix did here, which is he hits like three or four big moves in a row, and the last one is the end, and he pins him. Yes. Which makes sense. In real fighting, this is what happens. You hit a guy several times in a row, the last one's the biggest one, and that's how you win. So you got the win here with basically a sit-out muscle buster. And like I say, this was spectacular. This was otherworldly. I like that word. Otherworldly is what this match was. Uh, At the end, Nick is beaten. He offers a handshake. Phoenix gives Nick an ovation, but then will not shake his hand, turns his back, and walks away. And people were very upset about this. I have a few things to say about this match. I loved it. I know some some people didn't like it and probably be very mad at me for loving it, but hey, listen, you're all entitled to your opinion. I loved it. This match... Like... I, honest to God, I cannot remember a match where these fans popped for every single spot. They did. It's not like a match where they pop for the big moves, or they pop for a really big series, or they pop when Ken spills that pop all over himself right there. They literally pop for every single move in this match. They did because every single move was a finish. <laughs> Fine! <laughs> they popped for every single solitaire. There was not one well, moment where they were not in this match. They loved everything from start to finish. If the day comes where people do this match and people sit on their hands and they don't care, fine. Yeah, We're not there. I cannot remember. This may have been the best reaction I've ever seen for any AEW match on television it's from start to finish. It's way up there. On top of that, there was not one commercial break during this match. Yes. I don't know how AEW managed to do a full match without a commercial break. It seems impossible, but they did it. So there, there's a key to this beyond just that every move was a finish. That, that That's part of it. But the bigger issue is every move looked like a finish. It looked like something devastating enough and also cool enough that you'd be happy with the match ended at that point. Because these guys are great, and even though they did a million things and they're going a million miles an hour, everything they did was on point. They were crisp. They were sharp. They were polished. This was like there's um, this is an unfair comparison, but I'm incoherent. So I'm going to make it anyway. There was nothing or very little on this show, on the NXT show. There was very little that the Forgotten Sons just did wrong. But there was a lot of stuff that they did average or mediocre or subpar. Everything Nick Jackson and Phoenix did, every single move was executed to an A-plus capability. Not only that, Nick Jackson sold his shin. Yes, but this is one of the keys. He kicked the post last week, and his shin still hurt this week. It didn't hurt so bad that he couldn't do anything, Mm -hmm. but every now and then, ow, my shin. Well, Phoenix 
found a way, uh, as Nick kept trying the super kick and not getting it, he wasn't getting it because Phoenix would block or just counter kick and he'd kick the shin. Yes. He did a super kick to the shin, which was in super kick position. Now, I know... I know some people will say, okay, he sold his shin a little bit. Like, who cares? This match had no whatever, blah, 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 blah. No psychology, whatever you want to say. Listen, you know what what selling his shin meant to me? What's that, Brian? It rewarded me for paying attention last week. Yes. Do you remember the last time I was rewarded for paying attention last week on any non-AW show? If I say WWE, people would just get mad. Why do you have to compare to WWE all the time? Well, that's the other show. That's that's the A show. And how many times I've been rewarded for paying attention to the previous week? Never. In fact, usually if I do pay attention, I get even more angry. You get punished. That little tiny thing, him selling his shin, because last week he kicked the post, I was rewarded. That made me happy. So I like this match. I love this match. You can't do this match every week. But the fans wanted to see Ray Phoenix, Nick Jackson. They wanted to love this match. They didn't want anything except this match. That's the match they were given, and they loved every solitary second of it. So two thumbs up. We then go to Britt Baker versus Hikaru Shida. So... These women were put in a very hard spot having to follow Nick you don't Jackson say. and Ray Phoenix... Yes. So they were put in the hard spot anyway, but then they made it worse by basically trying to do lucha high spots and counters. Yes, I got a lot it, to say, Vinny. It so was get not going. the same. This this match did Britt Baker no favors. What I had just said actually about the Forgotten Sons. This match is an even better example. It's not like they were falling down and fucking stuff up. Everything just looked bad, and then it went a long time, and then you could hear individual shouts from fans. They were saying she's a dentist because they were bored. They said, give her a root canal because they were bored. Sheeta hit an ugly falcon arrow, but Britt Baker kicked out. And so Sheeta hit an ugly knee strike and pinned her. It was a bad nat- bad match. Britt got a busted nose. I don't know when or where, but that may have been why it was bad. But It was early in the match one way or the other. Well, that if she was working her, that may be why everything would look so bad. But this was, in fact, a bad match. Here's a, here's my thoughts on this, and I got a lot. This match was not good. It was and bad. This match was bad. Thank you. Now, here's... I'd like to repeat my material, but a lot of people haven't heard this. If you didn't listen to the Dave show. If I were running a company... I'll say this, actually. If I were running WWE, and I had someone like Britt Baker, who's had less than 100 matches... And she's probably never worked with a car sheet in her life. I'd say, guy's got three minutes. That's it. Mm -hmm. Okay. I would say that in WWE because WWE is on the road four days a week. And when they went to a house show, I would say, Britt, you and a car sheet are going 12 minutes. Go out there with no cameras and a live crowd and just do your best yes. and do that for four straight days and that's that's how Brit's going to learn to work, okay? Guess what? AEW doesn't have house shows. So, you have two choices. Either Britt Baker goes out there and does two-minute matches and she never improves or you put her in there with a Karashita and you say, you guys got 12 minutes and you accept that it is going to be a battle. And you just hope that after four, five, six months of this, she's a lot better. Those are your two choices. Pretty much, yeah. So, I don't know what the answer is. I mean, the, the, the fact of the matter is, this match did not kill the show. It lost viewers, but the viewers came back. And it was going head-to-head. I, th- I think on the other channel, Becky was still in there. or, or uh, Actually, I think it was uh, Ricochet and Matt Riddle. You're going to lose one way or the other. You know what I'm saying? And I don't think they should worry about the other show anyway. So just go out there, do your match. It's probably going to suck. But hey, she's got to get better. She's got to learn. This next segment. Apparently this was not proud and powerful. The the first one kind of looked like them. But yeah. So 
I've been asking for at least one week, I think longer, tell me more about these Dark Order people. Did they ever? Why is there a guy in a mask and his friend without a mask, and they're creepers? Why do they have creepers? What's going on here? And there's a backstory here far more, uh, I guess intricate's the right word, than I, than I had imagined. So we see there is, and pardon me for saying this, but it's the only way to say it, there's a fat nerd in the subway. And some bullies walk by. Just don't say old. <laughs> some bullies walk by. They knock his glasses off. They stomp on the glasses. They laugh at him. He gets on the subway, choking back tears, holding up his glasses, miserable, miserable about his fate in the world. And he looks up, and on the train, there is an ad. There's a man speaking this ad who is neither Evil Uno nor Grayson. It honestly looked like Orange Cassidy out of gimmick. But he's talking to the overlooked and the unappreciated. Unappreciated. He talks about how they can help them. But before you can find yourself, you must lose yourself. And as he's speaking, there's like groups of people on the beach or out in bars having fun. And they're popular and they're happy and they're good looking and they're healthy and apparently have money to blow. Their, their traveling world is very glamorous and, and, and fun to see. And then there's like little Bray Wyatt style video glitches where suddenly they're all wearing creeper masks and then they go back to normal. So the man says, before you can find yourself, you must lose yourself. Join us and become part of something bigger. We will be your friends, your biggest supporters. We believe there's strength in numbers. Open your mind and stop losing all the time. We will help you become just like one of us. Join us. Join the Dark Order. Great. And I don't... I mean that word. This was great. This explained what they are. Explained what... They're a cult. They are a cult. They prey on the disenfranchised and the uh, overlooked and unappreciated. They, they lure them in with promises of friendship and, and improvement. And then, of course, like all cults, they exploit and abuse their cult members and use them as slaves and lackeys and literally furniture. Great. That's great. I love this segment. Somebody on our board came up with the idea that Kenny Omega is going to join the Dark Order. He has been losing a lot. Because he's a loser they, lately. They, they explained that. I, now, I, I did try to think of who has been on a losing streak. But yes, well, all of the elite. I don't think they're all, <laughs> all joining the Dark Order. I don't think they're all joining the Dark Creeper Order. Creeper Nick and Creeper Matt. I'm not sure it would work because it's it's a little too goofy. I mean, at the same time, we'll get to Kenny Omega's interview, but I'm just not sure. But it was interesting when someone suggested that. They flat out said, stop being a loser. Yeah. And that's Kenny's gimmick is he's he's been a loser. He can't turn it around. That would be interesting. It was time for the Diamond Dozen Battle Royal, which the more I heard, the more I thought they were saying Dime a Dozen Battle Royal. So it's time to retire this name. Uh, the 12 men involved, I think I got them all written down. I got them. Billy Gunn, MJF, Pentagon, Hangman Page, Marco Stunt, Jungle Boy, Kip Sabian, Chuck Taylor, Orange Cassidy, Sonny Kiss, Jimmy Havoc, and Joey Janela. All right. You know what's funny is... I'm not saying this was a good battle royal, but like it was better than most. On the every whole. time AEW does a battle royal, people talk about how it just absolutely sucks and is horrible. And I'm like, do you not watch wrestling? Do you, have you seen a battle royal before? I mean, fuck, they you know, all you, suck and they're horrible. Every WWE TV battle royal is a thousand times worse than this. It's a bunch of geeks that stand around and do nothing. And it's boring, and maybe they have something exciting in, like, the last 30 seconds. What fucking Battle Royals is everybody watching where these Battle Royals are, like, the worst Battle Royals I've ever seen? Are they, like, 80-year-old fans who watch this Cow Palace Battle Royals? That's all they've ever seen? What? I don't, I don't know. AEW makes a point when they, when they do a Battle Royal, rather than say, we will do... Well, in this match, 10 guys got eliminated. So rather than say, we'll do nine random eliminations and then a finish, 
They say, for the duration of this battle royal, we are going to give the fans memorable moments. So we begin right, even before the match. Pentagon standing in the corner when his brother, Ray Phoenix, comes out to support him. But then Phoenix unmasks as Chris Daniels in disguise. Pentagon is distracted, immediately thrown out. Hey, there's something. They got something out of this battle royal already. It's already ahead of the curve on the battle royal scale. And then it's time just to, to, to celebrate Billy Gunn for a while. In, in 2019. The one Billy Gunn. Yeah. So, Mr. Ass. Well, on that note, yep. Sonny Kiss twerks for Mr. Ass. And even Excalibur is dropping references to the Mr. Ass lyrics about what he, what he likes to do and what he loves to do. So Mr. Ass is intrigued by Sonny Kiss's ass. And he was, I think he was going to have a twerk off. Yeah. But Sonny Kiss got eliminated by, of course, MJF. Mm. Everyone swore Mr. Ass. I love me a good roar spot. I've never seen a greater roar spot than we got in this match. <laughs> really? Everyone I don't know if I'd go that far. jumps in the giant Billy gun. It, 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 it's... It was made better because you can hear the one Billy Gunn counting one, two, three. And he's 6'5", and I don't know, 270 or whatever he is. And the other guys in this match, by and large, are they top out at about six foot and 220. And when he explodes, the timing is perfect. The biggest guys just fall down like twigs. The small guys are flipping like the, the, they're flipping like the War, War Raiders were in their match with uh, with the uh, Forgotten Sons. The cartwheels, the explosions, bodies go flying everywhere. I laughed and I laughed and I laughed. They did something in this battle royal to entertain me. Great. Jimmy Havoc starts stable gunning everyone. Conveniently, nobody bleeds. There's a commercial in the middle of this battle royal that irritated me. Sean Spears, who is not in the battle royal, eliminates Joy Janela. We get the big Orange Cassidy spot. Orange Cassidy, by the way, this gimmick was born from Battle Royals. Just stand in the corner and do nothing. I was Orange Cassidy in like 50 Tim Flowers Battle Royals. Pretty much, yes. So MGF throws Orange out. And then MGF does the spot where he backs up and big, giant, scary Billy Guns behind him. And MGF bumps into him and then reacts. MGF's presence and composure and facial expressions are decades Ahead of his age. Being a pro wrestler is really, really, really hard. And he sometimes makes it look really, really easy. Because he's really, really great. He's insanely great. Wardlow distracts Billy. I I, I guess we're going to get Wardlow versus Billy Gunn. God, that better be a dark match. (laughs) And as Billy Gunn is shouting, do it, do it, do it, MGF jumps up and rakes his eyes and pays them and it's Billy Gunn. This gives us what appears to be the final four of Jungle Boy, Kip Sabian, Chuck Taylor, I wrote Jungle Boy twice. Page is the other one. P-A-G-E. So, Penelope Ford helps Sabian dump Taylor. Then Jungle Boy immediately eliminates Sabian. It appears to be Jungle Boy versus Hangman Page for a diamond ring. But then, of course, MGF was never eliminated. He yanks Jungle Boy out. The bell rings. Next week, everybody... MJF versus Hangman Page with a diamond ring at stake. Which yeah. may be even weirder, actually. Yeah. I hey, enjoyed listen. this Battle Royal for what it was. I thought it was fine. I know people are like, oh my god, it was every Battle Royal trope there ever is. Yes, it's a Battle Royal. What in God's name do you want from a Battle I, Royal? I, I say again, 90% of Battle Royals are worse than this. I just don't know what people are expecting, what Battle Royals are watching. Well, you're watching the greatest Royal Rumbles and then watch the Dynamite does and you think it sucks? Yeah, it probably does compared to a great Royal Rumble. This is not as good as the first Aztec Warfare. But compared to a nothing happening Battle Royal that we've seen a million of, it was better than most. And yes, there were a bunch of Battle Royal spots in a Battle Royal. Chris Jericho comes out to make an announcement. He's accompanied by Jake Hager, who has a fantastic new nickname. Jake Hagar. Um, he has a fantastic new nickname, Brian. The Big Hurt. Yes. It's not original, but it's perfect for him. So Jericho explains he was fined for the tantrum he threw last week. He admits it was not the conduct a true champion should show. It was not conducive of Le Champion. He tries to say he is sorry. He cannot get the word out. Finally, he has to have The Big Hurt say it for him. 
His announcement is next week in Chicago, he will get the thank you he deserves. It will be Chris Jericho's Thanksgiving thank you celebration. And they're in Indy, so of course he takes shots in Indianapolis, explains why Chicago is better. He promises for his Thanksgiving thank you celebration, fun, games, prizes, an aquarium, maybe clowns. I hope so. He's about to leave when SCU interrupts. And they come out, and this show is not quite two months old now, and it seems like every episode has been dedicated to making Scorpio Sky a star. He does most of the talking for his team. And he, of course, you know, I've been wrestling for forever, but he's been a wrestling fan forever as well. So he makes a lot of old Chris Jericho references, calls him a paragon of virtue, which is something I think he only ever used on Nitro. He says, you forgot to mention why you threw that tantrum. It's because I pinned you and gave you your first AEW loss. And the crowd in my favorite wrestling crowd chant in many a day, you got pinned. You got pinned. Jericho's very pissed off now. Scorpio Sky says his every his his, his pay, phone's blowing up, his DMs are blowing up, his high school crush, Melody, whatever, is going to go out with him next week. And he announces this, and this crowd of wrestling fans goes, A girl! And they all stand up, yay! And Scorpio and Frankie do this big giant high five. I was in love with this segment. And Jericho says, I, I've, uh, I've, uh, well, first, first, Scorpio says he wants to apologize for embarrassing Jericho last week. Now Jericho blows his stack. Says, I've seen Melody Parsons. She has gained a lot of weight since you were in high school with her. And Scorpio says he likes big butts and he cannot lie. Because as you know, Brian, it's 2019 and big butts are in. And Jericho says, you are not in my league. I want to rectify that blemish on my record. I am going to have a singles match with you. I am going to wipe the apron with you. And Daniels and Kazarian were like, well, if we're going to have a match with someone at your caliber, we, we must have at least a month, maybe two, for a training camp to prepare. Jericho screams, no, and now he's petulant and he's whining. You get one week next week. It's a perfect exclamation point for my Thanksgiving thank you is me whipping your ass. And Cass says, well, listen. This can't be a title match. And Sky says, no, I don't deserve one. I'm not in your league. And Jericho is now, they, they've got, he has gotten to. You don't want a title match? Well, you're getting a title match. And then he grabs his hand and shakes it and says, it's official. We shook hands. So this whole thing has been 10 minutes of Jericho being wacky and SCU making him look like a buffoon and using reverse psychology to make him Daffy Duck, Duck season, Wabbit season. Just make him look like the biggest geek in the world. But now they've got their match. Record scratch. Joking is over. And Sky says, I have been waiting 15 years for a match like this to show what I can do. I'm going to turn Le Champion into Le Bitch. And a big giant brawl breaks out. And the inner circle all runs down. They've got the numbers. At least geeks tried to save them. Like Brandon Cutler ran out. Got overwhelmed. And... So so Sky gets laid out with the Judas effect. He's down. The Jurassic Express music plays. Marco Stunt runs down to the ring, hits the ring, and is immediately wiped out and killed. Jungle Boy hits the ring, ducks one move, and then gets wiped out and killed. Luchasaurus comes down to the ring, and of course, Jake Hagar steps in front of him. It's the two biggest guys in the company. They're about to stare down. And I don't know what happened. I don't know if this happened to anyone else or if it's just me, but my DVR suddenly rewound to the start of the show. What? And re-aired the Nick Jackson Phoenix match. That's like weird. almost in its entirety. So I've looked at what happened. I, I tried to load it on uh, the, the TNT app. That would not load for me. And I tried, uh, well, by that point, I had to come here and do the show. So I just missed it. But Looking at the results, it appeared I did not miss much. Nah, Luchasaurus and Jake Hagar had a stare down. Fans were going crazy. Luchasaurus chants. And uh, Jake Hagar, the big hurt. The big hurt. Backs down. And then apparently uh, Luchasaurus squashed the librarian. So a few things on this. The back and forth where they tricked him into giving Scorpio a title shot that was straight out of Ric Flair and Jerry Lawler. And the apology that the Big Hurt had to give for Jericho was straight out of Happy Days. Because when Chris Jericho was 10 years old, his hero was the Fonz. 
And the Fonz did this skit on a show. He did once have a cool jacket. And Jericho absolutely loved that. So after all these years, he, he finally, finally got to be the Fonz. Maybe he'll get a motorbike. The only thing that I would have done differently is the line to actually get a championship match. I forget what Scorpio said, but whatever he said, I thought it was way too wacky that Jericho insisted he get a title match after that. I think that Scorpio should have said, first they say, we need several months to train. So Jericho goes, oh, must be next week. He doesn't want the guy to have time to train, okay? Scorpio should have said, okay, fine, I'll do next week, but it's just too much pressure to have the championship on the line. I don't want that kind of pressure. I just want a match. Then Jericho makes it a championship match because he wants this guy to have that kind of pressure, so he buckles. That, I think, would have been a better reverse psychology to get Chris Jericho, because I can't remember what they said. What did, what did he say to set up the title match? Um, it was, I'm not in your league. I, I don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. That, that's too easy. That, that, that makes Jericho like, that's what, op- that's what made you offer him a championship match? It should have been that he wanted to give him the championship match because he felt that if it were a title match, Scorpio would be at a disadvantage. You know what I'm saying? Yes. So, yeah, that's what I thought. I liked it. So the next match is Proud and Powerful versus Private Party. Uh, I was joined in progress with this after my skip back to the beginning of the show. Uh, it was right around the time. In fact, I, I, I turned in right as Proud and Powerful were getting the heat. Had a great heat segment, great old school tag match. Everything is going along fine. And then Cassidy gets the hot tag. That's Isaiah Cassidy, not Orange. And he hits some wacky move. And he makes a cover. And the ref counts one. And the ref counts two. And the ref stops. And he turns and points. Excalibur says, I believe Ortiz pulled his leg. Or it was Santana. I believe Santana pulled his leg. Well, he did not. Santana was nowhere near. Maybe he was supposed to pull his leg, but he didn't pull his leg. So everyone's booing. Everyone in the ring is looking at each other. Everyone outside the ring is looking at each other. No one knows what to do. No one knows what was supposed to happen or what went wrong. It's just a disaster. And rather than just accept their fate and take this home, they dragged it out. And this was a bad idea. So the announcers are trying to cover, saying it was not the legal man in the ring. But then the guy who was not legal tags in or something. I lost track of what was going on. But they just hit, keep it in big moves. And one guy in private party is apparently hurt. Although I guess it was just part of this match. But I couldn't tell. And that's a bad thing in this instance. And it goes too long. And Nick Jackson steals the slapjack. And suddenly private party is fine. They hit gin and juice and win. This was a complete clusterfuck. Then there's more brawling. Dustin Rhodes is in there using his cast, and he helps them clear the ring. This was not great. This was... Listen, private party is green. I mean... We keep saying this, and people say, I don't see it. Well, the problem is... A! The problem is they had matches with Pentagon and Phoenix and the Young Bucks. These are great tag teams. Mm Mm-hmm. So, yes, they were carried in those matches. They're very green. It was very obvious in this match. I had people very angry with me that I didn't mention the ref thing. And quite frankly, I forgot about it. But I'll talk about it now. My issue my issue isn't even so much with the botch. Because you couldn't see the ref's foot when he stopped counting on television. So, I thought he actually got his foot pulled. If he didn't, that's another problem entirely. But my issue is, let's pretend for a second that the guy did pull his foot. How is that not a disqualification? It was very clear his foot was not pulled. But it doesn't matter, Vinny. Let's <laughs> pretend. Does, no, no. Let's pretend his foot got pulled. Okay. How is that not a disqualification? Well, we've seen in this promotion when guys can make tags whenever they want to or well, not. Well, I know, yeah. but that's because... They're trying to get rid of that thing, that aspect of it. Okay. Like, they, they, everybody knows you need to follow the rules. This has been hammered week after week after week. Everybody in the company knows you need to follow the tag rules. They're following the tag rules more now than they were week one. But 
if the referee is counting and you yank the damn referee out of the ring, that has to be a DQ. I know they don't want to do DQs. If you don't want to do DQs, don't do that spot. You can't put your hands on the It's official. bullshit. You cannot pull the ref out of the ring when he's counting. Otherwise, why isn't everyone pulling the ref out of the ring every time he counts? Right? Yeah. There need to be rules. And I know they don't want to do DQs, but you can't have rules if you don't have consequences. Yeah. Every now and then, a DQ is okay. So we know there are consequences. And so in storyline, the wrestlers know there are consequences. The bigger issue is that everyone immediately knew this was fake, and it killed the town, and they felt insulted. I don't think it killed the town. <laughs> well, they got the... Uh, it was very bad. A Kenny Omega promo. Oh, boy. Hey, I've been... I've been I've been saying I'm going to talk about this for two days now on Observer Live, and I haven't had time. Well, I guess now's my chance. That was a great time. All right, tell us what happened. Well, Kenny Omega is doing a bench press. With, I, I believe Nakazawa was spotting, spotting for him. He stops in his bench press to note he doesn't do a lot of promos. He's not known as a promo guy, which is funny, because I thought his delivery here was fantastic. He explains that he has... He's not a hardcore guy either, but he's doing a hardcore match lately. He has lost sight of who he is. He's lost his marbles. It all goes back to All Out in Chicago when he lost to Pac. Moxley, he says, he just cleaned, cleaned the scraps. But it was you, Pac, who sent me down this path. Now, next week, the powers that be have granted me a match against Pac. I'm going to need a chance of revenge, a chance to press the restart button. Redemption starts next week, and it starts at Pac's expense. Now double this bench press. And they cut to a wide shot where you see he has the bar and five pound weights on either side. And the guy adds a five pound weight to one side. And Omega says, no, no, just one side. And he bench presses uh, 60 pounds, I believe, is what that would be. Okay. So, <laughs> all right. This is probably going to make some people mad. They'll say I'm on the payroll. Listen, okay. This is my interpretation, all right? I don't think that Kenny's character is a guy who can barely bench press 65 pounds, okay? This is not like Skinner, where I'm supposed to believe that he's a dude who wrestles alligators in the Everglades. And for some reason, now he's on wrestling television, okay? My interpretation, and by the way, I'm not saying this is a positive. I'm just giving you my interpretation. You didn't see Raw. I did not. Okay. So on Raw, they're doing this deal where Lana and Lashley and Rusev are having this thing. Uh -huh. And Lana got a, a uh, restraining order. And they put the restraining order on the big screen. And it says, Kathy Joe Perry oh, Christ. is filing this <laughs> against Miroslav Barnyshev. So they're telling you that the ravishing Russian is actually an American playing a dumb character. Yeah. Okay. That's stupid. Mm -hmm. My interpretation of this is that Kenny Omega is an awkward guy. <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. He's a great wrestler, but he's not a character. He's Kenny Omega. And someone said, Kenny Omega, we want to film this thing. And this somewhat awkward guy decided that he was going to do something kind of goofy at the end. And he did this joke with the weights. Yes. That's how I interpret this. Okay. Now, here's the thing. If Kenny is going to be a main eventer, I don't know if this is the character he should be playing. Yeah. All right. But if he does this weird stuff... And he ends up being super over and draws. Fine. People like that character. Yeah. That, I don't know. Deep. I don't know if it's a main event thing or not. But I, 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 it was goofy. But to me, it's like, he's a goofy guy. He's a weird dude. He, someone told him to cut a promo and he did something wacky at the end. That was my interpretation of this. I don't know if it's good or bad. I don't think as a main eventer, he should be doing goofy stuff like that. But hey. That's Kenny Omega, for better or worse. 
Well, I watched this, and not for one second did I think I was supposed to believe that Kenny Omega could not bench press 60 pounds with ease. Uh, I thought that he was self-aware. He was making a joke about the, 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 the cliché of pro wrestlers doing promos at the gym, and they're all loaded up as much steel as they can get on there, and it's all steel and, and sweat and chalk and grunting and groaning. He's, he, like, he was making parody of that. He was in on the joke, is how I took it. Not for one second did I think anything else. So if anyone did take it that way, I, I don't know what to say. Um, and I, I also agree with your main point. If Kenny Omega, the payoff to his path of redemption should not be making jokes, wacky jokes in the gym and killing time. But if he's starting this, I mean, Kenny Omega right now is a mid-carder. And it's going to be for... He basically is right now. That's a fact. This, yeah. this is win loss record. <laughs> the win loss record is worse than that. Win loss is curtain jerker. But it, the fact is, he's a mid card. He's having a match with Pac in the mid card. He can do little jokes about this. But when he gets, to, when it's time for his redemption, when he gets finally his title match, uh, uh, second shot of the title, then don't do jokes about lifting weights or whatever. So it's fine. He's a weird guy. And I mean that in and out of character, on and off camera. I mean, we've seen this, even, even if you don't know who Kenny Omega is, if you just watch AEW, he's a guy who randomly one week will come out dressed as a video game character. He will uh, do a death match once in a while just because he feels like it. He's clearly a weird dude. Yes. So this was in character for that's, him. That's Kenny Omega. It was consistent with the character as he's been portrayed on TV. John Moxley versus Darby Allin in the main event. I don't know if Darby's going to do a wacky custom entrance video for every guy he wrestles. He should. It was cool. He goes to a concert somewhere. He puts himself in a body bag with mocks written on it in giant letters. They throw the body bag into the crowd, and he's crowd surfed. And then out on stage, some big dudes carry out this body bag and lay it down, and Darby's inside. So they're doing this match, and the 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 the. <laughs> it's one of those where you could tell John Moxley was having a lot of fun. Because for the first time in I don't know how long, he got to play the giant. Oh, don't I know. <laughs> it's the greatest. When you're working with Marco? Oh, man. John, John Moxley's doing spots where like Darby does a body press and Moxley no-sells it. Yeah, it's just stands there. It, dude it, bounces off him. This is big John Stud stuff. So, eventually, Moxley's working him over. And he gets the bag. He looks at it. It's got his own name on it. And he's pissed off now. And he throws it in the ring, and he zips Darby in his own body bag, and then starts to stomp on it. And the announcers are outraged. Allen can't protect himself. The referee can't see what a state he's in. He has to get him out of that bag immediately. And I had the best, like the best idea that I knew wasn't going to happen, but I was still disappointed when it didn't. But what should have happened was, what should have happened, Brian. When they opened the body bag, Omega should have popped out. <laughs> that would have been difficult. I don't know how. I don't know how they would have pulled this off, but it would have been awesome. No, it was just Darby Allen, and they kept wrestling. They had a fun main event. Uh, Darby tried the coffin drop once, but Mox caught him in a sleeper. And I think he hit it again, but Mox kicked out. And then they were fighting on the ropes, and... There have been a lot of scary head dropping moves lately. The dude, hold on a second. Darby lands on his head, even not doing head drop moves. That's true. <laughs> it doesn't matter what you hit him with; he's going to somehow land on his head. That is true. So we saw the you could give him a double sledge, like going down, and he'd land on his head somehow. He'll flip onto his head. Yes. We saw the DDT on the wood in the uh, lights out match at full gear. We saw Johnny Gargano DDT to the ramp. This double arm DDT off the middle rope looked looked scarier than any of those. And they showed like eight different replays and every single one looked lethal. This is not the Bronson Reed pile driver where from, from some no, angles. No, a bad, a, yeah, nothing like that. Every angle they showed looked like he was crippled. And Tony Schiavone screams, he's broken his neck, which I hope is not true. Mox pinned him. There's your main event. That was a... It was a I can't say that this was a great main event. It was a good main event. But I can say it was a really fun main event. It was a good TV main event. It is possible to have a really fun match yeah. that is not a really great match. Yeah. 
Not, but yeah, it was a lot of fun. Not everything needs to be four plus stars. And quite frankly, I mean, you know, Darby looked like he killed himself on that DDT, but he didn't. Good. And I'm happy to hear honest that. to God, like I expected a thousand times scarier. Like when they announced John Moxley versus Darby Allen, I was like, somebody is actually gonna die in this match. And by somebody I mean Darby Allen. <laughs> and really he didn't. He just he took a couple of crazy bumps. He took a paradigm shift DDT off the middle rope onto his head. And you know it was fake. He didn't get killed. So yeah, it was it was a fun main event. And dude, let me tell you something. This Darby Allen, if he doesn't die, is going to be O V E R. Uh yeah, over. People in the crowd painting their face like him. Yep, got this huge pop coming out. It, he doesn't even need to win right now. You know what's so great about this company? Unlike WWE, WWE has conditioned you, the viewer. That if a guy loses more than a few times in a row, he's done. Mm -hmm. He's a jobber. AEW has not conditioned you to that yet. So you can have guys like Darby Allen who lose more than they win, and he's still mega over. Because in AEW, and a part of this is because they don't do disqualifications and bullshit finishes, everybody has to lose. They've taught you that everybody wins and everybody loses. And it's okay to lose. In WWE, they do so many bullshit finishes that the top guys never get an L. Yeah. And so when you do get an L, first off, like half the fans talk about how you're being buried. Yes. You got beat one time. And like the reality is, if you do lose three times in a row, like Cedric Alexander, you are being buried. And the fans know that, and they're done with you. So. Yeah, Darby Allen did the job here, but I guarantee he will be more over next week than he was this week. Yes. Guarantee it because of this match. And and, and in the short term, the bigger star got the win. That's fine. Yes. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, it was it was overshadowed, obviously, by Nick Jackson and Phoenix. I think that's fair to say. And and you know, I'm sure guys want to hit a home run every single night, but you don't you don't hit a home run every single night. They had a good T V main event. Good. Yes. That makes me happy. I like your TV main events. your show. Yes. Don't worry about the other show. Don't. Anyway. AW, it's my vote. Yeah, I actually, honestly, when, because I watched these shows like 12 hours apart too, so I kind of forgot, but I was kind of on the fence, but going back over this, AEW was the better show. It's, it's, it's the same pattern. The best matches on NXT, I thought. I like the tag match a lot. But the best show was AEW. You know the worst thing about being told... Oh, no. ...that I'm on AEW payroll is? Tell me, Brian. I've never made a penny. If, if you were on the payroll... <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If you're actually getting paid, then great. If I were on great. the payroll, Hell at yeah, least I'd be paid. You should see what they're paying me. Every day i got to listen to I'm on the payroll. I haven't got a penny. It's bullshit. Two gold boats. God. Anyway... That's a review, everybody. We're out of time. I'll be back all weekend. NXT TakeOver is tomorrow. Survivor Series is Sunday. Raw is Monday. I'll be here every single... I did watch the Jack Evans-Kenny Omega match on AEW Dark. Really? I haven't even seen that one yet. Uh, it's not anything, anything you need to go out of your to see. Really? They did not go out there to have the best match they could. They went out there to have a match where Kenny Omega would get over. He took the entire match... That was good. So there's not a bad match, but it was, they could they could do way better. And Omega hit like a dozen moves in a row and a one winged angel and won. Hmm. So there's my quickie review of Evans Omega for the AAA Mega Championship. Then I watched AEW Dynamite, also November 27th of the year 2019. We open with Chris Jericho's Thanksgiving Thank You. I loved it. Yeah. Oh well, it's funny you say that, Vinny, because Dave did not love it. Really. He did not love this celebration. And it was funny because as we I reviewed it... I don't know how it, it's possible. He talked about all these things that he loved, but then in the end, he said he didn't love it. Well, I don't... You do. I was like, well, if you named eight things about it that you loved, I mean, it sounds to me like you loved it. You need to ask... I loved it. You need to ask Dave, because I can name well, it. I did ask Dave. I would need, I could tell you 80 things I loved, and in the end, I loved it. Yeah, I thought it was great. Soul Train Jones is in the ring. We're off to a hot start. There's... Giant presence in the ring. 
There's artwork. There's something under an easel. There's big, giant, inflatable mascots out on the floor dancing. There's, there's clowns and dinosaurs, a dinosaur. Clowns, yes. A marching cow, band on the stage. A marching band. Soul Train Jones very, very badly reads his promo from a script. My God. They gave him this thing to read, and like he just could not read this. It had to be intentional. Well, I mean, it wasn't, but... It they made, chose him for a reason. Yeah, that's also true. So Jericho comes out with the bubbly and a marching band. They're very happy to see him until he buries the city of Chicago. First, he says, if you check under your seats, some of you will find a coupon for 50 cents off a Le Champion t-shirt. And at least one person was actually holding up this coupon. So for all I know, they were legit. I think there was one under every seat. Probably was. And I, I, I love when he notes, by the way, this 50 cents comes out of his pocket. Yes. He's a very, <laughs> very generous man. Generous man. man, yes. Now, for the first part of this, I think they fixed it by the end. He was way, this wasn't his fault, but the microphone was way too over echoey. It's hard to understand. Well, the mic was too quiet, so you're hearing the echo from the arena. There you go. Okay. So he explains they traveled to Nepal to find the greatest grapes on earth. And using these grapes, they produced a, uh, well, you can go to littlebitofthebubbly.com. Which is, in fact, purchase. a real website. I hope so. It's like a, it's like one of those deals, like a wine club. And I guess sure. he's he's got littlebitofthebubbly.com, and you can actually go there and, and grab this. Sure. I should have done it. We could drink it on the Christmas show. That's true, which is coming. Yeah. We need plans for that. Maybe someone will send it to us. Maybe we'll get like 50 bottles of Little Bit of the that Bubbly. entirely possible, which would not be a bad thing. So he brings out his best friends, the inner circle. Sammy Guevara is so hated. It's awesome. Just hated. He says he has a priceless gift for Chris Jericho. It is a cardboard cutout of the two of them hugging. And Jericho is so happy, he gives Sammy a big hug, just like in the cutout. JR is so disgusted with this display of whatever and he's always so low-key about it he's not like on on wwe where you know if something's funny the announcers have to fake laugh and if something is is if a heel does something dastardly they've got to like yell and scream jr just under his breath says something like isn't that nice he's just <laughs> disgusted well jericho was not disgusted he was overjoyed what a great present thank you spanish god proud and powerful have a boricua gift basket they made a lot of jokes that went over my head, but it went over with his fans in Chicago. They declared Jericho to be an official Bariqua. Yes. And they put the Puerto Rican flag bandana on his head. And then Jericho notices someone's missing. Where is the big hurt Jake Hager? Yeah, this week he's no longer Jake Hagar. I guess. <laughs> this week Jericho he's, gave up. He's Jake Hager now, yes. So Jake Hager appears, I guess, in the aisle. He has a terrified farm animal, which he declares is named Chris Jarrett Goat. I laughed. <laughs> yeah. So Jericho's thrilled to have this. And he notes all the presents and he just wants to skip right ahead to the biggest box. What's in that big giant box? And so proud and proud. As soon as he says what is in that big giant box, you just hear everybody in the crowd. They make this noise. It's not like a cheer. It's not like a boo. It's like everyone's realization that there's somebody in this box. Sure. Like, is it Cody? Is it like, who could this be? What great baby face is in this box? JR goes, Abdullah? No, it's not Abdullah. It's, it's a callback to the Class of Champions from, I believe, 1991. It is Ted Irvine. Daddy Jericho. The father of Chris Jericho, who... Is the father of Chris Jericho. Yes. He's he's just incredible. <laughs> he's, these men are blood related. The one is a product of the other. It is so great to be back in <laughs> New York City, he says. Everybody Boo. moves. They chant for the Blackhawks. He says, I played for the Rangers. We beat the Blackhawks all the time. They were brutal. I don't care what you say. The Chicago Blackhearts were, and always will be, wimps. 
the best. That's the best. He talks about how he used to be the crap out of some guy named Bobby Hole. Do you know why I loved that line so much? It was authentic? Because when Jericho had that video a while ago, he had he had the lady that was like she she was at his church or something like that. Who was it? It was like his aunt's friend at church or whatever, right? Something, yes. Okay. So she had to say some line about, I think that Chris Jericho is going to kick his ass. And like the comedy was this old lady said ass, right? Or whatever it was that she said. So when Jericho's father says, they are, and they always will be, I'm expecting some profanity. And then he says, wimps it's like classic i don't even know if it was planned that way i just howled with laughter because that was the last word that i expected chris jericho's dad to call the chicago blackhawks wimps so ted had had a uh, uh rangers jerseys for the whole crew and they all have their nicknames in the back ruffian Le champion big hurt spanish god they're all very happy to put these jerseys on. The crowd's just booing them like crazy. And Jericho finally says, enough fun and games. I have this official thank you statement from the people at AEW and TNT. I'm not going to read it. I'm going to call in Justin Roberts to read this thing. Your boy, Justin Roberts. Who did great this week. At which point the fans all chanted, you can't read. Yes. <laughs> Loved it. So Jericho interviews Justin, who turns out is from the Chicago area. Yes. Clearly not from downtown, because when Jericho asked him what high school he went to, and he said Buffalo Grove High School, everyone booed. There were some boos, yeah. And then Jericho just called me and says, Buffalo Grove High School sucks. So Jericho, uh, uh, Roberts reads the thank you note. It's just a very nice thank it's you letter. very polite. It's very sincere. <laughs> sincere from the bottom of the heart. Well written. Uh, uh, grateful. Thank you letter. Thanking Chris Jericho for making AEW the most talked about wrestling league in the world. We are proud you are our champion. Thank you. Is how it ends. However, they do not like Justin Roberts' tone, so they all beat him up. Nobody choked him with his tie. I'm still upset about missed that. Missed opportunity. How do you how do you miss that one? Excalibur asks who beat somebody up in their hometown. And then the marching band runs out to make the save. It's SCU in disguise. And no one caught this. I did. Daniels put out Soul Train Jones with the Million Dollar Dream. You think I didn't notice that? That yeah. was a cherry on top of this Sunday. Yes. I loved it. It was fun. This was fantastic. This yeah. is my favorite thing on this show, for sure. It was great. So, Tony is on assignment. His other job has uh, prior uh, commitments. Filling in for him in this next match is Marco Solis Martinez. God bless the guy. He he needs a lot of work. Well, he was only there for the one match, and he barely said anything. And now, when he did, he was very quiet. And when he did say something, I couldn't hear a goddamn word he said. He was very shy, which is so not maybe, a good trait. Maybe he got that mic that Jericho had in the opening segment that was too quiet, but... Could be. Also, Dasha replaced Justin Roberts, and she was great. Also true. That is the same Dasha from WWE, for those of you that have not seen Dasha on AW Dark or on the Chris Van Vliet podcast. She is a fountain of charisma and if you watch her on either of those shows you will be even more flabbergasted at what wwe did to dasha or did not do it with her the best friends versus the lucha brothers orange Cassidy comes out in a turkey suit this leads to jim ross making a wkrp joke and excalibur notes yes we're chasing the over 50 demographic hard <laughs> i loved the thanksgiving thank you but that was funnier than anything else that happened on this entire show. Chasing the over over 50 demographic. So This match was set up in part by Trent beating Pentagon on Dark. Yes. So they do the tag match here. So they're doing the tag match. It's really weird. There's Actually, before you get into the match, I've got to, I have to get this out of the way here first, okay? I have ranted about heat during the commercial break for how long now? My lifetime? I think so, yes. Okay. In every single match on AEW, nothing important happened during the break. They got the heat before the break in every segment. The comeback started after the break in every segment. 
in not one segment did they go to commercial, and when they came back, you had absolutely no idea what was going on. They largely did that on NXT, but there was one match, I can't remember which one it was, where somebody hit a dive, and then when they came back commercial, that person was selling. So, if you're keeping track, AEW wins the properly placed television commercial award for the week of November 29th. And that means a lot to me. That's important. It is it's important. A, it's an important part of doing a good show. Yes. So the highlight of the match is when the Lucha Brothers did a flying kick to the crotch, or as Excalibur called it, a kick to the perineum. That made me laugh. Excalibur's great, if you haven't figured this out. Yeah, he is. So there's the heat on Trent, then the heat on Chuck, then the heat on Trent again, and then Orange Cassidy in a turkey suit distracts the Lucha Brothers. I'm thinking to myself, this is the weirdest damn match. And then before I can even finish that sentence, Trent pins Ray Phoenix with a sit-down pile driver. Yes. What the hell just happened? Well, what happened, Vinny, is... The no, best friends beat the Lucha Brothers. I fi- now, a couple and of things. And they're probably going to get a tag team championship. My, my immediate reaction was, for, my re- immediate reaction was, what in the hell just happened? The, the best friends pinned the Lucha Brothers? Then my a few seconds later, I thought, well, hey, you know what this tells me about AEW? They have proven that wins and losses do matter. Yes. And that they have built stars, and when those stars lose, it's shocking. Yes. When these stars lose on Raw, it's Raw. Well, here's here's the big difference, Vinny. This place doesn't do DQs. Not very often. No, we've never seen one. All right. Right? I, I don't remember any. We so. have never seen a DQ on this show, okay? So, because they don't do disqualifications, and because everybody beats everybody, yes, sometimes you go, why in the world do the Lucha Brothers lose to the best friends? But you know you don't think... Lucha Brothers must have done something wrong. They're getting buried. That's true. You know why you don't think that? Because in WWE, they do countouts and disqualifications and bullshit finishes to protect the top guys. If Randy Orton is going to be beaten, there's going to be outside interference, or there's going to be a disqualification, or there's going to be a countout, there's going to be whatever. Okay? Mm -hmm. So when somebody is beaten on Raw or SmackDown, you immediately think something must be wrong. Why would they beat Randy Orton? Unless it's like some guy on the rise or whatever. You know what I'm talking about? Like you always assume there's more to it. Whereas in AEW, because they don't do disqualifications, and because everybody beats everybody else, that's fine. They just lost a match. You accept it. It's just, well, they lost. I mean, you were surprised, but nobody came out of this going... These fucking Lucha Brothers, they just won't make tags right. And so clearly they're being buried now. Right, that never crossed my mind. Not for one second should that have crossed your mind. Now, Whereas if this were WWE, that'd be your immediate thought. Yes. Now thinking more about this on the drive down, because I was baffled, it did occur to me, the Lucha Brothers got to the tournament finals and lost. They had their rematch in the three-way. It's time for a new challenger. Why not the best friends? Yes, if you have rankings... Can everything okay over there? Yeah. Okay. You want to pick it up? <laughs> so, if you have rankings, okay, mm-hmm. and your number one ranked tag team based on wins and losses is the Lucha Brothers, mm-hmm. but as you noted, they already they had their chance in the tag team tournament. They they lost in their rematch. I mean, what? You're going to give them another championship match? That's what WWE would do. You would have to unless somebody beats them. Yes. Now, if you want to argue, well, it should have been another team other than the best friends, you can argue that if you want to, mm-hmm. but it had to be somebody. There's no pay-per-view coming up anytime soon. So, like, if they're going to have a, a more important team beat the Lucha Brothers, you do that closer to the pay-per-view. Also true. This was all fine. Yes. We have the rankings. The AEW Women's Division. The most important thing here, as well, it becomes important in a few segments. Number five is Allie. Number four is Nyla Rose. Number three is Emi Sakura. Number two is Britt Baker. Number one is Hikaru Shida. And the champion is, of course, Riho. B. Priestley and Emi Sakura versus Hikaru Shida and Chris Statlander. Jim Ross, during the introductions, drops an unfortunate oriental line, immediately corrected himself and says Asian. 
So, <laughs> I don't know. They did this match. It was fine. I like the, my favorite part was Statlander doing the Oklahoma roll because there's this move that no one does anymore, so it made her stand out. Dude, this match went way too long. They hit soccer with a dozen finishers. None of them were the finish. I, 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 my, what I wrote here, they hit soccer with like a dozen finishers that do not finish. This match is not good enough to warrant all these near falls. And then Sakura hit Statlander with a mic stand and pinned her with Lamastral. Match was too much. It was too long. And it wasn't even that long, but it was longer than it should have been. And it's just too long. That's all there is to say about it. I mean, the crowd the crowd was kind of into it, but not really. And, like, when it was over, I didn't feel like anybody got any more over. I, I saw the uh, Joey Janela-Chris Statlander match, uh, which was great. It was from Beyond Wrestling. And, like, when that match was over, I mean, I was more impressed with Chris Statlander than I was with Joey Janela. That's how good she was in that match. All right. But I didn't feel that way when this match was over. I don't know if it was just, like, the match wasn't as good, and so she didn't stand out as much or what, but it just went on too long and wasn't all that great and just kept going. Yeah. So, yeah. This is the first time I had seen her. I didn't know she she's certainly not shy. She's not a wallflower. She's not just there in the ring, but she did not stick out as someone uh, significantly more talented than anyone else in the match. Got a John Moxley promo backstage. Long story short, he's dangerous. He's crazy. He is napalm death, and most people will pray they never face him. But maybe somebody is crazy who has a, or has a death wish. He challenges anyone like that to face him. Cody makes his in ring return to face Matt Nix. Yeah. If you're wondering who Matt Nix is, it doesn't matter. He lost in a minute to a springboard cutter in a figure four. You know what's funny here was, obviously, Cody is going to be feuding with MJF. And we'll get to what happened after the match here in a moment. But when Cody came out, first they're talking about how he's number three. He's ranked number three, and we know that's not where he wants to be. And then they start kind of talking about how well, he's never getting a championship match again. So, you know, some people are asking why he's even ranked. And then Excalibur goes, well, you know, some teams are ineligible to play for a championship, but they're still ranked. And they're going over all of this explanation or whatever. So as they're going over this, Cody's coming down to the ring, and he's about to face Matt Nix. And it really hit me that if they're telling the truth... And they are claiming this, by the way. He's never getting another match again. Mm -hmm. All right? They're not just saying this in storyline, but, like, Tony Khan, in a media scrum, flat out said, like, he's not getting another match. We're not going back on stips. Cody comes out here, and I'm just watching him going, now what? There's a good question. You know what I'm saying? Like, he's the top baby face in this company, and we, the fans, have been told... He's never going to be the champion. So, like, what's he doing? What does he do after he beats MJF? He just wrestles Matt Nix on TV? Maybe he goes for the tag titles, I guess. But, like, it's just really weird. He's, he's 30... I think he's 34. Might be 35. I think he's 34. But, like, he's 34 years old. And unless this place goes out of business, he's here for the rest of his life. And, like, they're telling us... He's never going to be in a championship match again. It really hit me like, why did you do this? You know what I'm saying? I do. I, I, it, 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 it seemed rushed at the time. And yeah, I, I, I don't know what they do for the next half decade with this guy now. Like, I, I mean, maybe in his mind he's like, well, you know what? I am, I'm, a, I'm an EVP. I'm an executive vice president. I shouldn't ever be the champion. That's fine to think that now, but, like, you're going to be here forever. The day may come where they need Cody as the champion. Yeah. Why would you do this? Like, just say to yourself, I'm never going to make myself the champion. Just say that to yourself, and then, like, if the day comes, the day comes. But now you've you've done this. I don't know. I was just, I was watching this, and it just really hit me. Why in the world did he say that? So, as we talked about during the Cody-Jericho match, Cody did a dive onto the ramp and tore his face apart. It's two, two weeks later, three weeks later, 
So it's going to heal better than it is now, but it's going to leave a very nasty scar over his face. Like this, his dad will still have him beat on number of scars, but this scar, as far as who has the worst scar, may top his dad when all is said and done. It's almost like he had this horrible scar, and they were like, dude, we got to stitch this thing up. And he said, nope, (laughs) I'm keeping this one forever. That's how deep this thing was. And jagged and crooked. It starts here and goes all the way over here. So he wins quickly. He begins to get a promo on MJF when a hole in the mat opens up. And first I thought, here comes somebody from the Dark Order. I thought it was MJF. A masked man appeared. And then he pulls off the mask, and there's a man. There's a guy. And I stare at him, and Jim Ross stares at him, and all the fans stare at him. Even Cody just stares at him. And one guy, Excalibur, just screams, It's the Blade! Yeah. So a fight breaks out. Another man comes through the ring. Now, this man has a mustache and a monocle. And for those two reasons, I almost forgave all of this. But again, I stare at him, and Jim Ross stares at him, and the fans all stare at him, and Excalibur shouts, The Butcher! And I'm thinking, who? Who? I watch a lot of wrestling. I read about a lot of wrestling. Who in the hell are the Blade and the Butcher? And then there's a third person. There's a woman in a rabbit mask who sadly was not Peter from New Japan. That is sad. And Excalibur says, that's the bunny. And here I thought, well, okay, she's got a bunny mask on. That's fine. And then he says, that's Allie in her new name. Whatever he said. Uh, Did I miss a month's worth of shows? (laughs) Allie, who... Ten minutes ago, you told me he was the number five ranked wrestler. Yep. Now has a bunny gimmick. Yes. And has gone to some E-Fed creator wrestler somewhere and found two random dudes and brought them here to feud with your top guy? What on earth was this? This is like Excalibur had a dream and then it happened in the ring. I was flabbergasted. Okay, so I got a couple of things. Okay. One is a defense, the rest, trust me, are not, okay? It's many months before their next pay-per-view, okay? I think their next pay-per-view is in March. That's a so, long time. December, January, February, March. We got four months. Math. Okay. Might be earlier than that, but it's certainly not in December, okay? So you're not going to be doing Cody and MJF probably until that pay-per-view. Sure. So I think their deal must be, well, Cody's got to do something. Like, we can't just stretch this MJF thing out for three months. That's fair. Because it's not like WWE where, like, every month they got a pay-per-view. So I think that's why these mystery people attacked Cody. Okay? Now, with that said, when the first guy comes out and Excalibur screams, The Blade, Jim Ross says, Who is it? Excalibur says, The Blade. (laughs) And the fans start to chant, Who are you? Yeah. Then the other guy comes out. Excalibur goes, It's the Butcher. Jim Ross says, What? (laughs) And then Excalibur says, It's the Butcher and the Blade. Then Allie comes out dressed as a rabbit. And literally, they go to commercial, and Jim Ross says, and I quote, I don't know what's going on here, folks. <laughs> okay. I don't blame him. Okay, listen. There's a million things here. First off, I, I, I think I would have been better with this if Excalibur didn't know who they were. If, like, if nobody knew who these people were... And it was like, well, next week, maybe we'll find out who these two men are. Maybe Ali's going to tell us who these two dudes are. I think that would have been better, okay? I understand the idea that Excalibur is so great at his job that he knows 
everybody in wrestling anywhere on the planet. Okay? Fine. All right? If that's the story, then it doesn't matter who debuts from where. Excalibur knows everything about them. If that's the Excalibur character in AEW, I'm cool with that. Okay? But if that's the character, then when Jim Ross says, who is it? Then Excalibur can't just reply, the blade. He needs to tell JR he has wrestled and in, us yes. who this fucking guy is. He has wrestled in the Great Lakes or in California or in Mexico. I wherever think, the hell he's been. I think that was my problem with it. Excalibur clearly knew who these people were, but he still didn't tell us. He he expected us to know. I don't know if he expected us to know, but like if Ross doesn't know and the fans don't know, but he knows, it's his job to tell us who these people are. Oh. That's why it either should have been nobody knows who they are or Excalibur should have told us who they are. The way it was, it was just like, why doesn't Jim Ross know who these guys are? Why don't I know who they are? I'm trying to figure out why Allie was just wrestling on Dark last week and now she's dressed as a rabbit. Like, I didn't even know what was going on here. Like, we're supposed to say, oh, it's the blade. Oh, oh not, I see. Not blade, the blade. Oh, I see. Yeah, this was a this was a swing and a miss, as they say. <laughs> was in baseball. This this could have been done. We could have used Shivani here. It, yes, exactly. We used to call baseball. This was the opposite of Kane debuting at Bad Blood. I'll say. And why were they to the ring? I guess I, don't the, know. I guess the blade had something to cut the <laughs> canvas with, but it's just weird. That's how all his entrances now are cutting away <laughs> yeah, from the ring. Cuts his way That's why stuff. he's the blade. And the butcher should have a big knife. Or it's a big side of side of beef. Sure, yeah. yeah. So we got Pac versus And King. why is the bunny hanging out with the butcher? That ain't gonna end well. <laughs> I, I guess she didn't think this through. Well, clearly not. I mean, this was a big change. I mean, nobody I thought anything through about any of this. Pac versus Kenny Omega. So yes, Brian. This match was really, really good. It was great. I just don't have anything to say about it. They went 100 miles an hour. Everything looked great. There was a terrifying top rope Falcon Arrow. They went back and forth the whole time, and they countered finishers and Omega won with a cradle. I mean, I didn't write down everything that happened either, but there was a lot of stuff that happened. And it was an excellent match. Pac looked incredible. Kenny Omega looked incredible. Like, this was the Kenny Omega we should have gotten from day one. And he won the match, I guess. I don't know what's going on. That's the one thing. I don't know what's going on with this this Kenny Omega thing. Like, he was losing, 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 losing. And then, now, he's winning. This is an example of something that happened on Dark. That they need to talk more about what happened on the main show. But they were the, the Dark match was essentially an extended squash. And part of the story was... There's a new, more vicious side of Kenny Omega. I see. And be all, all, well, we need to be we need to be told about that. They or do shown footage of that. Yes, we need to be expl- have that explained more clearly, and don't assume everybody is watching every show. As and there's still more to come on this topic as well. Well, I mean, the thing that we learned last week was with that Phoenix versus Nick Jackson match, their audience will watch a great match, and that's what they got here. So we'll see what it does in the quarters, but I really liked the match. I thought it was great. Thought both guys looked great. Thought they looked like superstars. I have no complaints. Yeah. MJF versus Hangman Page for the Dynamite Diamond Ring. MJF cuts a promo. This ring costs forty-five thousand dollars. That's a hell of a diamond ring. Does dude. not belong in a white trash inbred hick from Virginia. And Page says Maxwell has made fun of his state. But tonight is about prestige. It's a big match and a $45,000 ring. He needs a big win. He is not much of a ring guy. But if Maxwell wants it, after I beat him, I can shove it up his ass. Wow. Yes. So they're doing this match. And Excalibur says, oh, by the way, Adam Page has left the Elite. Oh, yeah, this was another one. As seen on the Being the Elite YouTube show. Yes. Okay, if you're filming something and putting it on the YouTube show and it's about a departure from one of your main factions, you can't have it be a throwaway line in commentary. Show the footage on Dynamite. 
Well, there's a bigger issue, Vinny. If we watch this show and we imagine that when AW started on TNT, we began watching for the first time and we know nothing about nothing, Mm -hmm. which given the viewership of Being the Elite and the viewership of this television show, there's probably 700,000 people that never watched Being the Elite that are watching this show on a regular basis. Mm Mm-hmm. Who are the elite? Well, like we kind of know that it's a faction, and I mean, if you really think about it, you probably can figure out that like Cody's in it, and the Young Bucks, and Kenny, and and the Hangman. But I mean, what have they ever really done as a unit? They did one trios match. I mean, it's just like there's too much of an assumption that everyone knows everything about everything. Yes, and we don't, and. I mean, at least Excalibur explained that on being the elite, Hangman Page left the elite. But, like, first off, what the hell does that even mean? And second off, like, if it's important, maybe we should have seen the footage of that or something. Why did he leave the elite? Did why did he leave the he elite? Is he mad at them? Or are they mad at him? Yeah. Should I care about these people? I know why, because Dave explained it to me on Observer Radio. But, like, for everybody else that hasn't watched Observer Radio or listened to Observer Radio, like, this is just a giant puzzle piece in a puzzle that they have not fully explained yet. So it's a very hard to follow show sometimes. So Paige hits the buckshot lariat, but Wardlow puts MJF's foot on the ropes. So Paige leans through the ropes to get to Wardlow, but Wardlow punches him. And MJF follows with the worst crossroads ever. And I could not figure out if he had done this on purpose or not. <laughs> yeah, so he, he grabs him for the crossroads... But he doesn't spin. He just, like, takes a back bump. And this results in the hangman basically landing upside down, sideways, twisted on his own head. That's not good. And what I wrote here, and far be it from me to put over my own prose, but, like, this is a perfect explanation of this. The good news is it looked like he almost killed the guy. The bad news is, it looked like he almost killed the guy. Yes. That about covers it. That about covers it. So yeah, he hits this move. DDP comes out, because he's the one who's going to present the diamond ring. And he says he's here to present the first ever diamond dynamite ring to the winner, Maxwell Jacob Friedman. Some of your actions, he says, have been very disappointing to me. Tonight, you're the man. Since I'm the bigger man, I'm going to congratulate you like a man. He offers his hand. MJF spits his gum out, puts it in DDP's hand. They go face to face. Wardlow steps in. DDP tells Wardlow to step off because it looked really stupid if he got beat up by a 63-year-old man. They get in a pull apart. Refs break it up. Now, my big question, Vinny. Did I miss the ring presentation? Yes. I did? Yes. He gave it to him? He held it the box, ring in the box. Maxwell took the ring and put it on. Okay. I have nothing else to say then. All right. <laughs> that was my fault. I didn't write it down. I missed it. I thought I thought they did this whole thing and he never even got the ring. He got the ring somewhere. Okay, that was my fault. They have it in there somewhere. I think before before the gum, obviously. Yes. So yes, I I, I guess we're gonna get DDP versus Wardlow. I guess who knows? I can't imagine that DDP has got to bring someone to face Wardlow. That would make more sense. Yes. Yeah. Jen Decker is interviewing Dustin Rhodes. Who only gets about two lines out about how Hager broke his arm and Dustin's out for blood. The inner circle attacks. The Young Bucks make the save. Everyone gets shattered dreams. And that's that. Yeah, so next week, a six-man tag. We have another Dark Order video. That that fat nerd, and I'm sorry, but it's the only way to describe him. He goes to the... He finds the joindarkorder.com tag on a flyer and goes to their secret meeting at some building somewhere. I didn't even think to Google that. So... Ah, there it is. Stop losing and start winning. Oh. Join us. Let me click on this. Oh, look at this. Your path to enlightenment begins here. If you're interested in becoming part of the Dark Order, if you want to be a creeper, I guess, mm-hmm. send us your information and we will provide you with further instructions. Can? I'm doing it right now. Ken Nida. I don't want him to know it's me, Ken. Brian at WrestlingObserver.com. Phone? 
1-800-878-PLAY. Birthday. Oh, God, I got to scroll all the way back? It's going to take forever. <laughs> I'm assuming they can hear that. I am fucking old. All right. June 12, 19... 85. Brian Alvarez. Tell us your story. What's my story? You're tired What's of being... Ken's story? Your story, Brian, is that you were tired of being living in the shadow of your mentor. Tired of being belittled by the host of the radio show I produce, seeing as to how I constantly drop things on the floor and put my headphones on the mic, causing it to tilt down, at which point the mic, the headphones fall on the ground. All right. Spell check. All right. I am not a robot. Can you confirm that, Ken? Confirmed. Confirmed. Okay. <laughs> Confirmed. S submit. It is done, it says. There is no turning back. Wow. Thank you for signing me up for a cult. No problem, I appreciate dude. it. Hey, you'll, you'll get less than the Scientology stuff that I still get in the mailbox. All right. Go ahead, Vinny. So here on this video, so there's two guys who wrestle in the Dark Order. One yeah. of them has a mask, and he's named Evil Uno. Yes. The other is named Grayson. He does not wear a mask. So at this meeting, an unmasked evil Uno is speaking, but it's shot so you never see his face. Dr. Claw. It's brilliant. You see, like, the back of his head or, like, from the neck down from the front. He says, we could be anyone. Your, your friends have failed you. Your family has failed you. But the Dark Order will not fail you. We could be anyone. We could be a politician. We could be a teacher. We could be in charge of the care of your child. We are everything. I hope not. We are one. Are you ready to pledge to the Dark Order? And the lights go out, and the lights come back up. Everyone has a mask on except the new guy. And they all turn and stare at him. And he, he, he submits, I suppose. Now he is a creeper as well. I love the Dark Order. It's going to be a big creeper. <laughs> this, is, this is a hefty creeper. Scorpio Sky versus Chris Jericho for the world title. The highlight of this match, frankly, was Chris Jericho's Le Champion weight belt. Yeah. I know it's a stolen gimmick because Cody's got one. Not everyone needs a weight belt, but if you're going to get one, it should say Le Champion on it. So the first like half of this match, zero people believe Scorpio Sky had a chance of winning. Yeah. Absolute zero. And so it's not very good. Now, the seconds had been banned from ringside for this match. Usually in AEW... In title matches, anyway. Each man will have a second. And we've often seen tag team partners, whatever, in the corner. Everyone was supposed to be banned from ringside from this match. So at one point, Jake Hager runs down and jumps in the apron, and Scorpio Sky hits him and he falls down, and that's it. I was flabbergasted. I was very confused. How in the world... Like, how do you say that seconds are banned from ringside, and then one of them comes down, and, like, nothing happens? Shouldn't that have been, like... Well, you can throw the mat. The match's got to be thrown out, or or throw uh, something. There's got to be a have security come get here or something. No, it's just you're banned from ringside unless you want to. I guess so. who's in charge? Cody, as far as I can tell. Well, no, we saw that one skit with Tony Khan. But, That's true. I mean, listen, I'll forgive them if next week on television, like the Tony Khan character behind the door, who also, by the way, is like Dr. Claw, apparently. Yes. I mean, if he, if if Hagar gets suspended for two weeks or there's like some sort of consequence, fine. But like watching this match, there was no consequence. The rule was no one's allowed to come down. And then a dude just came down. Mm -hmm. The referee didn't even tell him to get out of here. No. Now, I will say this, for whatever reason... Once Hager ran down, suddenly then everyone believed in Scorpio Sky. So I guess they just never thought there was going to be a finish without a run-in. I guess. I don't know. They never even did the small package near fall. 
I was surprised I about that. I couldn't even believe that. Now, they did get a, a backslide over as a near fall, so I can't be too mad at them. But they had the, the easiest spot in the world, which they set up in two separate title matches, and they didn't finish up with it. And then Jericho, I mean, he, he, he kicked out of a code breaker, Scorpio Sky did, and he escaped the Boston Crab once, but he got put it back in it, and he tapped out. Yeah. And Jericho wins. The big spot was when Hagar came out uh, after the inner circle had been banned. He comes down to the ring, and Jericho rolls up Scorpio, and then Kazarian and Daniels come down. They run off Hagar. I guess he's Hagar now. i got to get used to that. But anyway, Jericho tries a belt shot because the referee is distracted, and Scorpio avoids it and hits him with a TKO, and he makes the cover, and the referee comes in, and the fans absolutely bought that as a finish, which they convinced. Here's another one. Because they don't do disqualifications, and because on any given show, a Trent, or as Jim Ross called him, a Taven, can beat a Ray Phoenix or a Pentagon, these fans actually believe that Scorpio Sky might beat Chris Jericho and become the AEW World Champion. It was astounding. And Chris Jericho kicked out, and they did their deal, and he won. And then they did the big stare down there with John Moxley, and that's another one. Like I don't think they're doing the Moxley Jericho match until the pay per view, so they got like three months. They got to do something in between. Mm-hmm. But they're they're going pretty quick with this one, so maybe this one will be a TV match. I don't know. But that was it. That was AEW. That was AEW, and that means it's time for our official tally. It is. Which show do you think was the better show this week? And my vote, Vinny, this week is NXT. You know what? I think I'm going to say the same thing. Because while there was a lot of stuff on AEW I liked, there was more stuff that left me irritated or annoyed or questioning what was going on. And I, listen, Pac and Omega was excellent. I did like Leo Rush and uh, uh, Akira Tozawa more. So NXT, as is usually the case, had the best match. Now, the best thing of the night was the Thanksgiving thank you. That was awesome. The Jericho celebration I thought was great. I thought the Pac Omega match was great. And I really did like the Jericho Scorpio Sky match. But there was a lot of stuff on that AEW show where I was just baffled. Just left scratching my head. The women's match went too long. The Diamond Ring match really... For all that, it wasn't all that good. It was just a match. It's just it was just basically a match. I think uh, the Cody thing. I was just my mind was just blown, and then some of the weird things like you know the non disqualif. I mean the whatever you want to call it here the uh, the run in by the second after they'd been banned. There was a spot in the MJF match where Jr. flat out said it should be a DQ, and he wasn't wrong. Like, you can't pull the referee in front of the way of a buckshot lariat, but the guy did. I mean, there's just a lot of little things on that on that show where it was not perfect. No. It was nowhere near perfect. NXT had the fun opening promo, the fun opening tag match, even if it did go too long. It had... Tazawa Leo Rush, the main event. Very good. Rhea Ripley was a star. The Rhea ripley Shayna showdown. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah, NXT for this week was the better show. All right, what's the tally for all the new listeners? Well, I have to do some very quick math here. Between the two of us... Let's go through the last seven weeks. All right. Well, okay. Is that how many we have? We actually have... You, you want to do seven specifically? We have nine. Nine weeks. All right. Week one, Brian, you voted for a tie. I voted for NXT. That was the last time until tonight that either of us voted for NXT. In the ensuing... What is that? Uh, seven weeks, we each voted for AEW six times with one tie. And then tonight, we both voted NXT. Well, there you go. That's the tally, so three, everybody. Between the two of us, three votes for NXT, three votes for a tie, and uh, be, I believe a dozen votes for AEW. Mm. 